testing, testing. Hello, hello, hello. All right, hello class. Uh, first off, sorry again that I had to cancel office hours for earlier today. I had to go pick up my daughter from a school event. So anyways, um, I'm gonna hold office hours after class. And I know that that quiz was due um, at the beginning of class. So whatever you turned in, you turned in. Um, after class, I, I can answer questions on it. And then um, I'll give you an opportunity to resubmit if, if you feel like um, you need to make some adjustments to it. Um, if you turned it in already and it's correct, you'll get more credit than somebody who turns it in after class correct, if that makes sense. So. Okay, um, any questions before I continue optimization? I'm not going to talk about the quiz or bonus. I should call it bonus because it's a bonus. Um, I won't talk about that till the end of class. So any, any other questions about optimization just generally? Yes. So I guess I'm still just kind of struggling a little bit on identifying when I'm going to have a constraint and when I'm not. Glad you brought that up. That was what I was going to mention. When you're working an optimiza optimization problem, you're always going to have an, object an objective function. That's going to be the thing you're trying to find the max or min of. And that should be a function of a single variable. Sometimes within the word problem, you will have a constraint, which means that you'll have a way of, of um, it, you might have an objective function that starts out as a, a function of more than one variable. You might have two variables in there like X and Y. And then the constraint within the word problem will allow you to solve for one of the variables and replace it into the objective. Not every single problem is going to have a constraint. Um, you may, you may not. You'll always have the objective function, but you'll, you may or may not have the constraint. It just depends on the word problem. So there's not like a you know, I can't say you're always going to have one. In fact, we did problem here. See the wire problem that we did where we cut the wire. When we did this, we came up with, we came up with a formula for the area of the square and then the area of the circle. And both of those had X in them. And because they both had X, when we came up with the objective, which was the total area of both, we never had to solve like we didn't have two variables in there. We just had X. So there was no constraint. Does that make sense, Cody? Okay. Yeah. I was thinking it was something to do with the domain for some reason, like a, like it was a parameter why I couldn't exceed, but never mind. I see now. Now look, this problem, I know you'd have to go back and review this problem, but when we did it, we said we had a, a 20 foot wire and we were going to cut it and we said, okay, let's cut it X. And then the, the second um, section of the wire that's left over, we immediately said that that would be 20 minus X. Somebody, someone else could have just said, hey, let's, let's call that Y, okay? And then we would have worked out the area, the area of the circle in this function or this right here, this area function would have had Y's in it. And then you would have added them together. You would have had X's and Y's together. But then your constraint would have been that y has to be 20 minus x. So you could have done this problem in it and still gotten a constraint in there. Just depends on the way you approach the problem. There's not, there's not like a cookie cutter way for every one of these. That's what makes them challenging. So everyone is kind of uniquely different. It's kind of like the related rate problems we did earlier in the class when we were doing implicit differentiation, that every problem is unique. So I can give you like a template of things to do, but when it comes down to it, it's, it's your interpretation of the problem 
and making sure you can get everything set up properly. Okay, let's do more optimization. Because like I said last time, there's just, you know, there's never, there's no such thing as doing too many optimization problems. So here's a classic problem, a, a very um, real world applicable problem here. Um, and we have not done this, right? Some, I don't know why my brain is telling me we've talked about this. I don't think we have. Uh, if I remember right, we did a, we did do a volume function question, but we didn't do like a can or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, I don't think we did a can. We, when we started this out, we started with the farmer and the, the pens, and then we did, uh, we went right to the wire. And then after the wire, I think I gave you a problem to work where I changed things a little bit that had an impact on domain. And then I gave you the, the extra credit problems or the bonus, yeah. So we have not, we have not done this. So let's read the problem. A can must hold one, one liter and just for the sake of knowing what one liter is, one liter is a thousand cubic centimeters. Find the dimensions of such a can with the smallest surface area possible. So I have an animation here for you to help you kind of visualize what's going on here. So if I wanna make a can that holds one liter, okay, this is a, beer can or soda can or that's a big beer whatever you want it to be okay it's one liter of whatever you want it to be all right so here's a can right now i have this computer programmed right now that i can change the dimensions of the can but it's always going to be one liter okay so notice right here it says volume is a thousand cubic centimeters i'm going to change the shape of the can i want you to see that that thousand stays the same the whole time Right. So I could make a can if I wanted to. I could manufacture a can that would look like this. OK, so you'd be drinking it. It'd be this big old like disc. You'd be taking sips of this little thin disc, right? Drinking your one liter. Or I could make the can really tall and really narrow like this. Right. This tall little you'd be sitting there drinking it like this. Okay, both of those shapes hold one liter in, in every combination in between, right? But I also have the computer calculating the surface area, which is this number right here. And notice that depending on how I build it, I'm going to have varying surface area. So if I make it too flat, do you see what's happening to the surface area? If I make it too, too short and too wide, the surface area starts to get really big. We're at like 954 square centimeters, a thousand. See, I can just keep going and going and going and going. Get this huge surface area. Here, let me go the other way. Now it's getting smaller. You're focusing hopefully on the red surface area, 800, 700, 600, 500, up back to 600, now 700, now 800, 900. So somewhere in here is an optimal way to build it to construct the can so that it holds one liter, but it has the minimum surface area. That would be something you would want if you were manufacturing these and you had to pay for the aluminum to make the can, right? You don't wanna just like arbitrarily make the can. You'd like to minimize the surface area to, to um, spend, I guess, the least amount possible on the aluminum that, that's required. Understand? Yeah, quick question. Okay. Did you have a question, Cody, or no? Yes, sir. I, I was just thinking I had just a little bit. Would this be then a closed interval because we can't go over a thousand for the volume or well no the volume? Well, the really volume change fixed, at all, so. but the surface area is not. This is a good question. Is there a, a domain issue? So just think about the radius. Right now the radius is getting bigger, right? Radius gets big, height, height gets small. Theoretically, now this is theoretical. Theoretically, I can make that radius, you know, 30 feet. And I would have this really, really thin can. It'd probably be impossible to manufacture, but theoretically I can go infinitely wide with this. And then it would be infinitely short or I could go infinitely tall with it and it would be infinitely narrow. So theoretically there is no restriction on the dimensions because they all still contain one liter or yeah, one liter. Okay, that's the general framework of the problem. All right, here we go. Cam must hold this. So, okay, how do we do optimization again? 
we need to figure out what, what the objective is, right? So the objective here, the objective function, or sorry, the objective, let's just write what the objective is. The objective is to um, get the minimum surface area, right? So I'm gonna call, for, this, for the sake of this problem, I'm gonna call surface area A, okay? So we want the minimum area, right? We just understand I mean surface area. So let's write down <clears throat> what the area of this can is. So I've gotta draw a can. There it is. All we know is this holds one liter, right? That's all we know, it holds one liter. So that can <clears throat> is going to have some height to it. And that can is going to have some radius R to it, right? What is the area of that can? So we have, we have a, a circle on the top, right? The top of the can. We have a circle on the bottom, which is the bottom of the can. Each of those has what area? <clears throat> What's the area of a circle? Pi r squared. Pi r squared. So this should have on top pi r squared and then another pi r squared on the bottom, right? So two Which pi r squared times h. Okay, so two pi r squared. So that represents the, the two means we have the top and the bottom circle. Understood? We still need, though, to figure out the formula for the area of the can that goes around. So here's a way that I can animate this, not animate this, that we can visualize this. Let me get a um, piece of paper. <clears throat> so if we were to have our can like this, right? It's our can. Then we already accounted for the top of it and the bottom of it, right? We have that accounted for. So what we can do to figure out the area around it is we can just imagine cutting this open, cut the can open and lay it flat like this. And if we lay it flat like this, we have a rectangle, okay? So if we look at that rectangle that we would have, we know that this side is H, right? That's the height of the can, but how long is it? The circumference. It's the circumference of it. So think about this, when, we, when you look at this, this circle right here, the circumference, when we cut it open, the circumference is actually this length up here, right? So this is the circumference of the circle. And we know that the circumference is two pi r. Well, we know, we should know that the circumference of a circle is two pi r. Which means the area of this should be two pi r times h, right? It, the area of a rectangle is just length times width. So it's two pi r times this, that's two pi r h. So we need to add that two pi r h. Does that all make sense? Now we could, we could have looked that formula up, but that formula is actually easy enough to get ourselves. So I think it's, it's better as a, as a thinking human being to actually like think through it rather than just go look it up if you can. All right, so there we go. That is the formula for the area of a cylindrical can. Now, if we look at this area formula, it has two variables in it, R and H. So we need it to be one variable to do calculus. And I should mention to you that this optimization idea comes up again in Cal 3. And in Cal 3, we learn that we can actually still do this and we don't need to get it to one variable. We can actually leave it in terms of two or three or four or five or six, it goes on forever. But in Cal 3, we, we come up with this, this new way of doing optimization that's much more powerful. But in Cal 1, we have to get it to a single variable because that's all we're doing in this class. Everything is single variable. Sometimes you'll hear Cal 3 called multivariate calculus or multivariable calculus. That's because you're doing calculus with multiple variables instead of just X or, you know what I'm saying? Or that makes sense kind of? That's a, that's a bridge you will cross. If you're gonna take Cal 3, you'll cross that bridge later. I was wondering that because I think it was one of the homeworks. I was trying to do something before I looked it up and 
I ended up taking the derivative of a X and a Y. And then I was like, man, I got DY, yeah. DX. I'm just like, I've got problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that that was probably being done with multivariate. Okay, so here we are. We have no choice. We need to see if we have a constraint, a way of making this so we can replace one of the variables. And I think it would be worth our while to see if we can replace the H because the H is the only thing that's out of place there. So do we have a constraint? Do we have one? Well, think, think well, about the, the can, volume. Right? Yeah, the volume yeah. is the, yeah, the volume variable. has to be one liter, right? That's fixed. Mm -hmm. Like that is the constraint. We're not just making any can here. This can has to hold one liter. So we know that the volume of the can must be one. I'm going to put 1,000 cubic centimeters because we're going to do everything in centimeters now. So instead of one liter, I'm going to put 1,000 cubic centimeters. That's what the volume must be. So what's the volume of a can? Isn't it like four over three pi r squared or something like pi that? Pi r That's squared. A sphere. That's a sphere. Oh, sphere. OK. So I think I heard it. What do you say, Bree? Uh, pi r squared times h. Pi r squared times h. So I'm going to put it here. Pi r squared times h should be equal to 1,000. Now, the formula Bree gave us, I want us to think about this formula. Pi r squared is what? Just pi r squared by itself is what? Area. The area of the circle. So it's almost like we're saying you take the area of that circle and then you multiply it times h, which is how how deep it is, right? So it's like how many layers of that area do you have? And that's what gives you the volume. Okay, now if you look at that formula, this is great because it has h in it and r and it's an equation, so I should be able to solve for h. So if I solve for h here, I'm gonna get h is 1,000 over pi r squared. Just divide both sides by pi r squared. Now we have an equation for h. So now back over to the objective. The objective is now that the area should be a function of just r. And it should be 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r times h, which is 1,000 over pi r squared. <clears throat> And we're going to get some canceling here. We're going to get some cleaning up, some algebra. So let's see what, what goes away here. I get one, I get the pi to go away, right? The pi on top, pi on bottom cancel. I get one of the R's to cancel. So I still have an R on the bottom. I have the two times a thousand. So I should get plus 2000 over R. And that is my objective function. Questions on the objective function? Would we take it a step further and just distribute the R so we can then? Uh, what do you mean distribute the R? We'll get like a common denominator. So I have like two oh, yeah. R well, cubed plus 2,000 over R. I'm going to do that after I take derivative. I'm not going to do it now because you know, I mean, technically, like I know, I know I need to take the derivative of this, right? Like I'm already thinking I need the derivative. So I'm actually gonna rewrite it like this. On the, this is really the version I'm gonna work with because this will be easier to take the derivative of if I just bring that R up, right? If I do a common denominator here algebraically, you can do it, but then you have to take derivative, which means you'll have to do quotient rule. So I would just bring the R up. What should we look at next? Derivative. That's next, next. What's before that? I don't know why students always miss this step. The domain? Domain, good. Domain, because remember, there's two ways to do this now. We either have a closed interval method or an open interval method. So we need to think R is the variable. Is there a restriction on R? So back in the picture that we were doing, remember we were talking about this? Is, oh, what happened? Is there a smallest R I can have? Is there a biggest R I can have? No, theoretically. Theoretically, no. Theoretically, no. And it has to hold one volume. So 
sorry, has to have a volume of one liter. So you can't tell me that the radius can be zero because it, it can't be zero or else you'll have no volume. So you still have to have a can that holds one liter. So that means that my, my radius is gotta be bigger than zero and less than infinity. And right there, I know this is gonna, this means I'm gonna be doing open interval. And all that means for you is that you're gonna have to do that number line with the test points, remember all that? And then go, you're gonna be looking for where it goes up, down, down, up, all that. You have gotta do that whole method now. So let's go with the derivative now. So my derivative is, let's see, four pi r minus 2000 r to the negative two. So that's just some power rule stuff. I'm gonna rewrite that as four pi r uh, minus 2000 over r squared. That's just dropping that r to negative two down. I'm gonna go even further than that. I'm going to make this four pi r cubed minus 2000 over r squared. So what did I do there? Distribute your common denominator. Common denominator. Okay, so I'm not showing that work because we've done it enough and just put r squared you know, on top and bottom of this fraction. And now let's go figure things out. Where is the derivative equal to zero? So anytime we have a fraction equal to zero, we set the top equal to zero only. Let's see, I can, um, let me do this. Uh, I don't know how much I wanna do in my head here. I'm gonna take the 2000 to the other side, make it positive. I'm gonna divide both sides by four pi. I should get 500 over pi. Do y'all agree is R cubed? And that means that R has to be the cube root. And I don't have to do plus or minus because I'm doing a cube root, not a square root. The cube root of 500 over pi. So I'm gonna get on my calculator now and get a decimal for that just so I have some idea what it is. Uh, stop. So 100 divided by pi, raise that to the one third. I get that this R is approximately 5.42. I'll, I'll even put the unit centimeters. Okay, here we go. You are not done, okay? If you stop right here and you tell me that that's where you have a minimum, you're gonna lose points on the test because we have no idea if this is a minimum or not. We have to show it is. Right, so to show it's line. a minimum, go ahead. What? I, was, I was thinking about it, but now it's the number line, you put 5.42 yep. in there and then you gotta get a value on either side and yep. plug it into the derivative, if I remember right. I, yeah, I, I would say plug in, let's say maybe one in 10. I don't know, I mean, you can make your own numbers. Just remember that at zero, you don't want to go over here because um, the domain radius has to be positive. I think we can agree on that, right? The radius has to be positive. So um, just pick something to the left of 5.42 to the right of 5.42 and plug those into the derivative. So a prime of one, a prime of 10. So where was my derivative? Okay, it's up here. So taking a look at this derivative, we can do this in our heads, I think. If you plug in one, one cubed is, is one, and then four pi times one is four pi. So four times pi is, I don't know, somewhere around 12, 13. Take away 2,000, you're going to have a negative on top. And then any number squared is positive. So this is going to be a negative over a positive. So that means we're negative. And because it's negative, that means the original function a is going down here. That's a good sign because we're looking for a minimum, aren't we? So we need it to go down and then back up. And then let's plug in 10. If you cube 10, you get like a thousand, then you hit it with four pi. It's gonna be bigger than 2000. So you should get a positive on top, positive on the bottom. 
And because you have a positive derivative, that means the original function is going up. Okay, right there, we know now, we have, we have a minimum. So we have a minimum area when R equals the cube root of 500 over pi, which is approximately 5.42 centimeters. Okay, we still have not answered the question because the question said, a can must hold one liter, find the dimensions of the can. All we have found is what the radius has to be. Now we need to figure out what the height is. So, so where do we get the height from? Plug it into the constraint. Yep, our constraint had the height right there. The height is a thousand over pi times r squared. So let me, let me copy that. Bring it down here. So using this, okay, using that, I know that the height then would be a thousand over pi times the radius squared. Um, yeah, let's just do 5.42 squared. We're approximating this. Can somebody get what that is for me? 9.37. What do you get? 9.37. I didn't, I didn't hear that. Sorry, I can't make out what you were saying. I got 10.84. 10.84. Yeah. You should get about 10.84. Same. Does anybody see something interesting here? Yeah, the height is double the radius. And what's, when you say double the radius, that's equivalent to the what? The diameter, area. right? Two diameter, yeah. the diameter. So what, what this is actually telling us is this. If you wanna make a can that has the minimum surface area and it holds one liter, you need, you need the, you need this height to be 10.84 centimeters and you need the diameter to be the same. God, that's terrible. Okay, 10.84 centimeters. The radius, the radius happens to be half of the height. It just, I mean, it, it is true. That is not a coincidence. That is the way it is. For any can, any aluminum can, if you wanna use the minimum surface area, then you'll always want your, your diameter and height to be the same. If you do that, you'll use the least amount of material possible. Now, we know that in the real world, that's not the way it works, right? So give me a second, I'll be back. I'm gonna go get, go get a can, I'll be back. Ryan, you there? Alec, and then uh, Alejandro, you too? Right here. You read the latest chapter? Nah, man, I'm still stuck on the dress roll shark, actually. Oh, geez, bro, you're far behind. So you're at where the dub is right now. <laughs> That's where the bro. dub is, all the way back there. No, yeah, you I read, read the it, latest chapter. It's, we get to see Yamato's form, devil fruit Dude. ability. See, like, so I've seen a bunch of theories that it's like, it's going to be some kind of mythical dog or something, but. It's the, there's a. A it, cultural it, reference to it it's uh i can't remember what it's called but yeah there is and it's, it's not like, looking too good for carrot joining the crew well there's a there i saw like thoughts it's like it was like she's maybe a kidding she's like the thunder beast from japanese yeah War. i saw some mm -hmm. people talk that they were the nine colored deer which is some mythical deer from somewhere i don't even remember where it's it's wild okay everyone i've got a couple of cans here i've got your classic coke can you've got a Dole pineapple juice can. Happen to have a very small V8 can. And none of these are made this way. Now, there's a couple of reasons why. First of all, this can is not a perfect right cylinder. 
right? The bottom of it has this little indention and it has a rim here. It's not perfectly cylindrical, right? Do y'all know what this thing is here for? Is it for support because perfectly cylindrical, it just kind of caves in on itself easily? It's a little dome, like it goes in a little yeah. bit here, right? Mm -hmm. This is because if you leave this in your car, it gets really hot, pressure builds up in here. And this is like almost like a relief. This will pop out. So if you've ever like left a can in the car, this will be pushed out here like a little dome sticking out here. That's oh, to yeah. prevent it from just blowing up. Now it still will blow up eventually, but um, that's what that's for. And then the top of it is also not flat, right? This is actually a separate piece that they manufacture and they push it on to, at the end. So this is not gonna, follow this what we're doing right here right but i guarantee you somebody has done the calculus on this okay and somebody's figured out the optimal way to make this can all right and this can also but because we're there's a human element to everything right there's always a human element you the companies have to balance things they have to say okay do we want to make a can the way everyone else is making a can or do we want to do something a little different? Are we willing to pay a little more per can to have something identifiable? Like everybody can identify with like a Red Bull can, right? Tall, skinny cans, right? Like it's identifiable. Sometimes that's worth the extra cost, right? So that's just the way, <clears throat> that's the way um, <clears throat> marketing works, right? But as far as if you were asked, you know, a, a pure mathematician to go design the can, they're going to optimize it. They're not going to care about what a human, what a human thinks. It's going to be like that. That's what will cost you the least amount of money. Okay. That's it for that problem. Pretty interesting, huh? Let's look at another one. It this? seems like optimization is just finding the best possible outcome. That's not necessarily going to be translatable to like reality to an extent. It's like, this is where you should aim for almost is what I get from it at least. I think there's it's translatable to reality. Here's here's a problem. Well, I'm not saying it's never I'm saying more like it's not gonna be perfectly like I, I don't know maybe I'm oh yeah well that that's that's math that's math overall right I, I mean you have to you know, always have to remember that that mathematics is just a way to try and model what, what we see around us, right? We're trying to look at, look at things, find patterns, be able to describe the way something's happening, be able to predict what's gonna happen. And mathematics allows us the tools to try and model things. Models can be very simple and models can be very complicated, right? So it's the best we can do, but it's never perfect. You know. What happens is you get physicists and engineers and what they do is they say, here's what we're trying to model. And then the mathematicians try and come up with the, with the equations or functions to model that. And then the physicists and engineers use those equations. But then they'll say, you know what? We're using this equation and we're getting results that aren't matching what we're seeing. We're observing this, but the equation's giving us this. Oh, well, we didn't take this into account. Okay, we need to go modify the equation, right? We need to go modify things. Um, you know, you can talk about, I think when you take basic physics classes, when you start doing free body diagrams, if that sounds familiar to anyone, you start off with no friction, right? You're like, an object is sliding on a frictionless surface. Well, in the real world, there's friction, right? If you want to start talking about friction, then we need to, we're going to have more complicated equations. If you want to talk about not only friction, but you want to talk about um, the um, the humidity, the humidity can, can affect the way something is moving or, or changing. So, I mean, there's a lot of things. There's so many variables in play that the better your model is, if you want to get your model better, you've got to have um, better math for it, which is why multivariable calculus is so important because you can have like um, computers that predict weather, right? How many different variables are, are those computer systems taking into, into account? right? Temperature, humidity, pressure, you know, all these different inputs, maybe there's like 40 inputs and then they get one output, like the probability of rain that day, you know? I mean, that model is very complicated. Okay, we're, we're getting off. Okay, here's, here's a problem. Find the point on the graph y squared equals uh, 4x minus 1, which is closest to the point 3, 1. 
So I have a picture to go with this, but before I show you the picture, what I would expect from a Cal 1 student is to be able to look at this, realize y squared equals 4x minus 1 is a parabola that opens sideways. Okay, that is a parabola, but it's sideways because the squared variable is x, not y. I mean, sorry, y not x. So this is a parabola that opens sideways, and then this is a point. So what we're trying to figure out is which point on this parabola is closest to that point. So here's a picture of what I'm talking about. Here's the parabola, okay? And here's the point. And I can sit here and look at all these different points on the parabola and calculate the distance between those two points. I have the computer doing that for us right now. Right now, the distance between these two points is 5.213. But as you move along the parabola, that distance changes. Now we're down to four, now we're down to three. Uh, let's see, we're down to three here, 2.8. And then look, it looks like 2.3, 2.1.9, 1, somewhere around there, somewhere in there, right? Somewhere in there is the point that's closest. And then as we keep going, it gets further away. Y'all see that? So where exactly on that parabola are we closest to this point, right? Now, where is this? Where would this be applicable in the real world? Could you can you if think of where we might want to know something like this? I mean, I'm thinking like minimum distance or something. But hmm. what if this point was the Earth, and this was the path of this huge asteroid, right? Oh yeah. Then we would know, we would want to know. So when you know when things are out there in space, we can we can look at them, track them, and we can actually come up with the path, what path they're on. So we can come up with a function that will show where it's going to be at every point in time. And then what we can do is we can say, okay, well, when's it going to be here, and how close is it going to be? Because you see this on the news, right? Like uh, tomorrow, a meteor is going to be really close to Earth. It's like you know. 200,000 miles away, but it's like pretty close, you know, and that's what they're doing. They're just trying to figure out where on the path of that asteroid or meteor, I forget what the difference between the two is, um, you know, where is it closest, going to be closest to the earth? That's exactly what this problem is. All right. So let's see if we can do this. All right. So what's the objective here? What do you think? Are you, what do you want us to answer you? Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking of an objective. We want to find the minimum distance from the function to the 0 0.31. Minimum distance from parabola to the 0.31. That's what we want, right? We want to find the minimum distance from the parabola to that point. So what is the objective function we're going to be looking at? What is it we're trying to minimize then? The parabola? Well, how do you mean? Like in the previous problem, we wanted to minimize the surface area, right? Here, we want to minimize what? Would it be the distance equation? The distance, right? The distance, right? So we want to minimize the distance between two points. Okay. We want to minimize the distance between two points. One of those points is on the parabola. The other point is given to us, right? Do y'all understand that? The two points we have one of them is on the parabola and I don't know what it is. And the other point is the point three one. Okay, wanna minimize the distance between those two points. So we need a formula for the distance, right? If we wanna minimize the distance, we're gonna to need to figure out what the distance between these two points is. So what is the distance between two points? Yeah, square root of x2 minus x1, and then is it either, I think it's minus y2 minus y1 or something. Yes, Square. good, good. So <sighs> this goes back to college algebra. 
This was a formula that you were hopefully shown at some point that if you want to if you want to find the distance between two points, in this case x1 y1 and x2 y2, this is the formula. Now for us, we can call this. Uh, let me call this one x1 y1, and this one x2 y2. And let's just rewrite the formula. And I'm going to go to capital D instead of writing dist down. Distance is the square root of, okay, x2, which I'm going to put x minus um, x1, which is 3 squared, plus y2, which is y minus y1, which is 1 squared. Okay. Now's a good time for questions. If you have anything, anything that needs clarification trying to minimize the distance between two points, right? One of them, we don't know what the point is. The other one, we know what the point is. So we came up with the formula for it. Right now, our distance equation is a function of two variables, x and y. So we need it to be all in terms of x or all in terms of y. So do we have a constraint? Yeah, the y squared is equal to 4x minus 1, I think. You could... Yeah, so what do you mean by that? We do have a constraint. Right? Well, if, if you solve for the y, to find the y, what the y actually equals, you get you get y by itself. But, well, maybe, I, I don't know why I think. No, you're is. right. But, okay, when, I, when we're sitting here saying this formula right here, right, this distance formula, this is the distance between an arbitrary point, right, x, y. Okay. This point right here is arbitrary, completely arbitrary right now. Yes? Mm -hmm. completely arbitrary. This would give us the distance between any point and the point three, one. But that Wait. point can't just be any point, right? It has to live on the parabola. So we need to use the constraint that this point is not free to float and be what it, whatever we want it to be. It has to maintain this equation the whole time. So the constraint is the fact that this point x, y must be on the parabola, right? Mm -hmm. So the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to go back to this equation. I'm going to do something over here with it. I'm going to solve for x. So I added one to both sides. And then I divided both sides by four. So I got this. Now, I, I want to remind you of something in case this is not going to be obvious to you. I just need to show you something on a new page. I'll come back to this. When you have something like a function like f of x, or you can say y equals f of x equals, let's say, x squared, we all know what this looks like, right? We all know this is just your basic old problem. Any point that lives on this parabola, the x coordinate is whatever it is, x. And the y coordinate, because this is the parabola, would be x squared, right? You could always look at this point as x, x squared. So if this was like 1, that would be 1 squared, that'd be 1, 1. If this was 2, this would be 2, 4. If this was 3, it'd be 3, 9, right? So it's like if you know the x coordinate, you can tell me what the y coordinate is. And the problem we're doing right now, because it's easier to solve for x, like I did, now what I can tell you is this. If you know the y coordinate, if you tell me what the y coordinate is, this is the formula for the x coordinate. So this is always 1 fourth y squared plus 1 fourth. Do you all understand what I'm doing there? solve this for x so I know that to live on the parabola, whatever y is, the x coordinate would have to be 1 fourth that y squared plus 1 fourth. And then it would live on the parabola. Am I making sense? Yeah, you're, you're basically saying it's just that you solve for it. So anytime, if you have y, you can find anything, basically. That's right. If you know what y is, you can figure out what x is. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back in here. And I'm going to replace the x, the x with this. 
okay? Because that's what it is. So it's, it's going to be uh, one fourth y squared plus one fourth. That's what x is, minus three, all of that squared plus y minus one squared. And there it is. We have our distance formula. It is now a function of one variable, isn't it? Right, d of y. So I could change that to d of y. What's the next step? Domain. Domain, right? Remember this time, yeah. So what is the variable? What is the thing? What is the variable in this function? Y. Y. Okay, so go back to the picture. Are there any restrictions on Y? Y is, y is the Y coordinate of the point. So is there any restriction on the Y coordinate? It can go down. Just, just look yeah. at the Y coordinate, which is how far down we are. We can go as far down as we want to go, right? And we could go as far up as we want to go, right? Mm -hmm. So do you all agree right now it looks like the domain is pretty much all real numbers? Do you all agree with that? Yes? But, uh, but wouldn't, wouldn't it that be, be realistic just from the picture? Wouldn't it be realistic for us to say, hey, look, it's got to be in here, right? Somewhere. Mm -hmm. So like if I let y be, let's say I let the point be here, their y is zero, isn't it? That would be one extreme. I know that somewhere between y being zero and let's say, I don't know, way up here, maybe, maybe up here the y coordinate's about four. Somewhere between y being zero and four is the real answer, like the, the correct, the optimized answer. I can do that, I'm allowed to do that, but I need to understand the graph to do that, right? So if you don't have the graph, you're just gonna to have to go with the domain as all real numbers. But if you have the picture, we could actually restrict it down between let's say zero to four. I'm gonna leave it open because you may not have the graph on a test. So I'm gonna leave this open and I'm gonna say then y must be uh, between negative infinity and infinity which means we're gonna to have to use the open interval method. Okay, now comes a very, a very contentious part of the problem. We are trying to find the minimum distance, right? Which means we have to take the derivative of this. And that is going to be pretty bad because you've got a square root and then all this crap underneath. This looks a lot like the bonus problem. If you did the bonus problem, this looks a lot like the bonus problem. Um, and there's kind of two like schools of thought on this. And, and as long as I've been teaching this, I, I, I understand the pros and cons of each one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you kind of both approaches, all right? And then I'm gonna tell you the one that I like. So the first approach is just do the, do the derivative, okay? I mean, just take the freaking derivative and just do what you've been taught to do. So I'm gonna do that first. I'm gonna take the derivative of this and it's gonna suck because I have the square root of all this crap, right? I'm taking derivative of the square root of all this crap. So according to what we've learned, chain rule, the derivative of the square root of anything is one over two times the square root of all that crap, right? So I've got to take all of this. I get to cheat and copy and paste, but that goes here. Okay, that takes care of the derivative of the square root of all this. Chain rule now says times the derivative of what's in here, right? So I'm gonna take derivative of what's in here and I notice that I have an addition symbol here. So I, I can do all of this first and then plus all of that, but it all needs to be in parentheses. So here we go. What is the derivative of all this stuff squared? Well, I have to bring the two out. Yeah, two times all the stuff. And then it's all that stuff. Uh, can I put these together, please? Can I make that minus 11 fourths? Is that all right if I do that right now? 
one fourth minus three is the same as one fourth minus 12 fourths. That's negative 11 fourths. I'm not doing a derivative there, I'm just doing arithmetic. So it's all of this stuff, the two came out. So it's that stuff to the first power. I don't need that, but I'm putting it there. Times the derivative of what's in here. What's the derivative of what's inside? Gonna have one half, uh, one half y. One half y. Okay, that's the derivative of this. Okay, plus, now this derivative is a little easier. Two comes out, two times y minus one to the first power times the derivative of what's inside, which is one. I'm putting these things here, even though you don't need them. And that should be it. You all okay with this? Not pretty, but then just move everything over to the this equals I'm gonna take all this. Okay, I have a big division bar here. Okay, let's see if we can't clean up all of this goes on top. So do y'all see that this two and this half go away? That two and that half go away. And then I can distribute the y through here. So I should get one fourth y cubed minus 11 fourths y plus two y minus two. So that's just me distributing that two through. You okay with this? This turns into one fourth y cubed Let's see, we can combine these two together. So combining those two together, eight four, I think you get negative three fourths y minus two all over two, well, this thing. That's your derivative. Okay. Any questions? We can just, can, you just copy paste and so it, I think that's why, but we could just make that the minus 11 over four in the denominator as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. You could definitely change that to minus, uh, minus 11 fourths there, I'll do it. Okay, so let's think about this now. When is the derivative zero? Well, it's a fraction, right? So the only time that zero is when the top is zero. And we've run into our first real issue here in this class. Like we've never had something like this happen before where we have an equation that we can't solve. Um, what I am gonna do is I'm gonna clear the fractions. I'm gonna multiply everything by four. It'll just make it look a little bit nicer. Multiply that by four, that by four, that by four. And this equation is not a quadratic equation, right? And we do not have a way of solving this. Well, we don't have a quadratic formula for this, right? Cubic. Right. I wonder, is there a cubic formula? If we have a quadratic formula for solving quadratic equations, is there, is there a cubic formula, do you think? You think there's a formula out there to solve a general cubic equation? What do you think? You know what I mean? Like we have a formula for quadratics, the quadratic formula. Mm -hmm. If it's cubic, so you have a third degree, do you think we have a formula for that? Uh, wait, I don't think it's a formula, but isn't this where you have to like add in the y to the second or something like that to solve? It's like add the- You can try that. You can try doing something like that. It may or may not work. What I'm saying, the quadratic formula always works, doesn't it? I mean, in terms of, it's gonna give you answers. You might get imaginary numbers, but it always gives you an answer, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, most people don't know this, but there is a cubic formula. Show it to you. 
There it is right here. I see why most people don't know that it exists. Mm. Yeah. So this is the quadratic formula for solving quadratics, right? If you have ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, then you have this. But if you have a general cubic equation, ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d equals zero, then the solutions are given by this thing. Isn't it pretty? Oh, so, she's alive. Yeah, it's crazy and we don't teach it, but it exists. Do you think there's a fourth degree formula for like AX to the fourth? I'm gonna assume there's probably some generalized formula with like something to end where you basically have to go based off of like whatever exponent you have. Let me see if I can find it. Quartic equation. So wh where would we actually see this, sir? Like, here it is. Not hold, like on, hold on. Okay. So here we go. Here's here's for the fourth degree. Uh, you actually have you have four possible solutions, and here here's what they are. Okay. But the problem with this is that each of these letters in here, P and Q, have to be calculated also. It's, it's a worse formula than the third degree is. It's more complicated than the third. Do you think there's a fifth? Sure, yeah. right? Seems like it. There actually isn't. And it's not that we have never found it. It's that it can be proven that once you get past four, form, a formula does not exist. So that's a different statement, okay? To say something doesn't exist means that we've proven it doesn't exist, that it's impossible for it to exist. That's different than saying we've never found one, okay? So it has been proven that for degree five and higher, there are no formulas. It's only degree one, two, three, and four, and that's it. And what's even crazier is that the cubic formula, this right here, this formula is what proved to mathematicians that the square root of negative one needed to be dealt with. For the longest time, well, I'm going off track here, but when, when we're doing the quadratic formula, I'm, I'm gonna go off track, sorry, I have to. When we do the quadratic formula, let's say we have a parabola that does this. Oh, let's do this, let's do this. We have a parabola that does this. We should have two x-intercepts. So when we do the quadratic formula, we should expect to get two answers, right? Mm. If the parabola does this and just touches the x-axis, we do the quadratic formula and we expect to get one answer. If the parabola does this, we have no x-intercepts and the quadratic formula is going to give us an imaginary number. It's gonna give us an i. We'll, we'll get a square root underneath that root, you know, in the quadratic formula, the square root part, we'll get a negative under there. For this type of parabola, this happens. And so for the longest time, mathematicians were like, well, okay, well, that makes sense, right? You have answers, you should be able to get them. If you don't have an answer, then you're gonna get the square root of a negative number. So everyone's like, okay, it all makes sense. The world, is, the world is at peace, okay? And then it was discovered that we had a cubic formula. Here it is. And do you see that in this cubic formula, we have square roots? There's also cube roots, but there's also square roots in here. And so what we determined is that, well, look, when you use this formula, when, when people were using that formula, they were getting square roots of negative numbers, okay? Some, some, sometimes they were getting square roots of negative numbers. They're like, well, wait a minute. That, we can't do that, right? But what's wrong with that logic that we, we just throw it away is this. If you graph me a cubic function, all cubic functions, think about college algebra. When you're talking about cubic functions, x to the third power, you were taught about left and right hand behavior. And you were taught that either the left side goes up and right side goes down, or it's the other way around. It's gotta be one of the two, okay? For all third degree polynomials, that's what happens. So no matter how I do this, if I did this and it goes down here, it's gotta go through the x-axis. And if I do it the other way, it goes down here and goes up here, it's gotta go through the x-axis. There's no way to graph a cubic function 
without an x-intercept. You must have at least one. And so because of that, we went, shit, we have to make sense out of what the square roots of those negatives means then. And that was the birth of the imaginary numbers. I mean, they were born before that, but that's when mathematicians started to actually take it seriously. Like, we have to address this. Okay. All right. So that's all I'm going to say. You want to study imaginary numbers, you're going to have to take higher level math classes. All right. So what the hell are we talking about? I forgot what we were doing. Okay. So we're sitting here at this cubic equation and we don't know how to solve it. Now we could use the formula, but we're not going to. All right. So right now, unfortunately for us, we are going to have to leave this as an open question. In the next section, I will show you how we can solve that. I'm gonna show you a method to solve this that you've never seen before, all right? But for now, I'm, I'm gonna to have to go to use technology to do it. So I'm gonna solve this on a computer. So I think I'll go to Wolfram Alpha. So I wanna solve, what is it? X cubed minus three. Uh, I'm using X instead of uh, Y. Y. Yeah, I'll use X instead. X. So it was y cubed minus 3y minus 8. So I'm having the computer do this for us. And I'm going to get it as decimals. The only real solution we get is 2.492. Y equals 2.492. Is there any way to do that in a regular calculator? Some calculators have solvers on them and they will solve them. But I can tell you that the way it solves it is about is what I'm going to show you in the next session. Okay. The way it does it. All right. So we are we are waving our hands there. We are saying we are we are we have submitted to the problem because we can't do that, but we use technology to get the problem to get the answer. Now we do need to address address one more thing. We need to know where this derivative uh, possibly doesn't exist. Right? Where would this derivative perhaps not exist? Well, that would happen any time that all of this crap down here is zero, right? Or if we get a negative underneath that root, do y'all agree with that? And that seems right now to be a pretty monumental thing for us to have to put our, you know, wrap our heads around. Like when is this thing zero? Or when is this thing get a negative underneath? But I can tell you right now that this will never be zero and it'll never be negative underneath ever. I can tell you that just right off the bat. Why, why can I tell you that? Why can you tell me that? What does it represent? Where? Where's that? Well, each of these are squared. Okay, so this is squared plus this is squared, right? So it can't ever be negative. I agree with that. This can never be negative because you're taking something squared plus something squared. So it can never be negative. But how can you promise me that this will never be zero under here? Think about where it came from. What does it represent? What does that square root thing represent? Because this is what we're talking about, this denominator, right? What does it represent? Well, it's this, isn't it? And that represents what in our picture? The coordinates on the function. Yeah, but what does this spit out? What is this spitting out for us? What is it actually giving us? The distance. The distance between those two points, right? right. And what can you tell me about the picture? It's it always is. gotta be greater than zero, right? I mean, mm -hmm. like that has to be, unless that three one lies on the parabola itself, that distance will always be, zero, uh, be greater than zero. So just, just by the knowledge of me knowing that this represents the distance between the point on the parabola and the point we're talking about, I know it can never be zero. So, when I sit here and I have to contemplate the idea of when is the derivative not exist, none, there's nowhere, right? This doesn't happen. But it's because of my knowledge of what this denominator really represents. So I only have one critical number. And so now I need a number line. 
2.492. Pick a point here, let's say one. Pick a point here, let's say four. And where do these get plugged in? Derivative. Derivative. So I need the derivative at one and the derivative at four. Now it's going to suck to plug this into the derivative. But remember, what did we just say about the denominator? It always has to be what? Greater than zero. Positive, right? So really it just matters what we get out on top. That's all that really is going to matter. So if we plug one in here, you get one right here and one right here. You get one fourth, take away three fourths, take away two. You will get a negative number. I'm not going to show that, but you get negative, which means that the distance function is going down here. That's a good sign. If we plug in four, you will get a positive number and that means the distance function is going up here. And we have thus found a minimum value. I'm trying to fit all of this onto one page. So the minimum distance, we have a minimum distance at y equals two, I mean, let's go with 2.5, okay, 2.5. And if that's what y is, can you tell me what x is? Yeah, we solved for it. Yeah, we solved for x uh, back here, right? So if we plug that y value, 2.5, into here, we should be able to get x. So x will be equal to, and I'm going to cheat because I already have the computer giving me the answer. Here's the solution. It's 1.8. You should get 1.8 for x. So that's the actual point, 1.8, 2.5 is the point that lives on the parabola. It's on the parabola, but is the closest possible point to the point 31. What's the distance? Because I think it says, oh no, it says find the point. It doesn't ask us for the distance, but could we get it? Yeah, you if just do the, the distance formula with your Yeah, just tutors. plug it back in here and you've got the distance. And I'm going to put it here just so we have it. Just the distance would equal, and I'm going to, again, cheat using the calculator. It's a 1.913. We're right, because the 1.8 and the 2.5 would just be our x2, y2, right? Yep, that's all it would be. OK. How was that? Was that all right? And all make sense? Take some practice, but yep. We did have to wave our hands though, right? We still have this open question of how do we solve this cubic? We'll get to that. Um, I, now, that was the way that I would expect a student to work this out, right? I said, remember, there was like two different ways and the other way, yeah, I don't know. So I want us to go back to this step right here and we're gonna kind of, we're not gonna rework the whole problem because we've already done too much on it. But when we are here at this step, the thing that makes this problem very complicated is the square root because then it makes the derivative kind of nasty. So there's this idea. So, so think about this. If this represents the distance, right, between two objects, let's say that this distance turns out to be some number, right? Whatever it is. Then what if I asked you to take that distance, whatever it is, and square it, okay? That would be a new number, right? The idea here is this, what, whatever, whatever y you can find to make this the smallest is the same y that makes that thing squared the smallest. So whatever value, I'm gonna say it in words, whatever value of y minimizes the distance will also be the same value of y that minimizes the distance squared. So if you can just tell me what minimizes the distance squared, then that will be the same y that minimizes the distance. So a lot of times what books will do and authors will do is they say, okay, instead of doing this, I'm going to look at the distance squared. And when they do that, they get rid of the square root. So what they have is this. without the square root. And then they do the same thing. They take the derivative and set it equal to zero and all that. And you get the same exact results. 
The thing it saves you is the whole chain rule with the square root, okay? I'm not gonna do it this way. I just want you to know that if you, if you run into this later down in your, in your life, doing an optimization problem in some other class, and you're trying to minimize a distance, and all of a sudden you see them square it and then do the calculus on that, that's what they're doing. If you do it the other way, you'll get the same result, so. All right. What's the next problem? When you take the derivative of that, would you have to do like the dy squared side as well and have like two d of y like that? No, if you take the, no, no, this, just look at this right here as being some new d, okay? We'll call it lowercase d. Lowercase d of y is just this new equation. And so you're just taking the derivative, it's like d prime, of, you know, d prime is okay. y, right? All right. And whatever you get here, you'll get critical numbers, you know, da 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 da, do all that. And whatever your number is, that's your minimum, blah, blah, blah. That minimum, I guarantee, will be the 2.49. Whatever we had earlier, it'd be the same thing. All right. Two eleven. I'm trying to debate between this. I think I'll do this one. I think I'll do this one, yeah. We might do them both. I have two more that I wanna show you. So um, let, me, <clears throat> let me give you the problem here. It's gonna take me just a second to get to it. I had it up and then it closed on me. So give me a moment and I'll post it here. Oh, come on, come on, he broke. Okay, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you about five to eight minutes, maybe maybe about eight minutes or so to just see how much you can do on this. Can everyone read that? Okay, see what you can do. We won't go too long. I'll give you a hint that you're going to need to call on some things from pre-cal to do this problem, formulas and things like that.
You go like two more minutes. I'm not expecting that you solve the problem, just to at least get the objective set up, maybe. Okay, I think that's enough time to at least get us thinking about it. Uh, Samuel, you're you're up today. Are you there? Yes. Okay. So, what's the objective here? What are we trying to do here? To find the shortest possible time to get to the other side. So we want to minimize the time. Yes. Minimize the total time it takes to make the trip. Okay, good. So let's call that capital T, Samuel. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Do you have anything for capital T? Um, hours? Like, well, what at I'm rate looking of... at is can you tell me, like, in, in just layman's terms, how oh. what T is? T, the total time is going to be what? Just talk to me in words. The amount of time it takes us to get to point C. Okay. Which if we travel using, so she, she's starting at point A, right? Has to get to mm -hmm. point C. And she has a couple of options, right? She could just, just go straight across, couldn't she? Mm -hmm. And in that case, she would be rowing the whole time. Agree? Yes. Or she could aim at some angle, row across to some point and then have to walk the rest, right? Yes. And that would be a different amount of time because she's going to row less, but she's going to have to walk also, right? Mm -hmm. So the total time should be broken into two pieces, right, Samuel? What are the two pieces? The time it and takes to do. Walking and rowing. Okay, Both. so I'm going to do it this way. The time it takes her to row plus the time it takes her to walk. Agreed? Yes. That'll be her total time. Her rowing mm -hmm. time plus her walking time. Now, in terms of her rowing time, that's this right here, right? This red. Yes. And that red could be there, or it could be there, or it could be there, or it could be straight across, or it could be like here, or like almost straight up, right? If she mm -hmm. just if, if she just went if she if she pointed almost straight up, she would only row for a little bit and then walk the rest. Do you see that, Samuel? Yeah. Okay. So, in general, though, the red will represent her her rowing part, right? Red for row. Hey, that. Okay, and then the blue will represent her walking distance. Yeah? Yes. Okay, so now we need to figure out how much time it takes her to go this distance. Now remember, hopefully everybody remembers this, that speed is distance divided by time, right? Speed is distance divided by time, which means that time would be distance over speed. Have you all ever seen this before? How does it go? I haven't done this in a long time. Oh, 
how does it go? Uh, I think it goes like this. Have y'all ever seen that? No? I think so. Uh, yeah, it's usually just kind of like a, a straight line instead of, you know how you divide into three? Yeah. Just to kind of symbolize a division symbol. Yeah. D and T and DS. So yeah, like, so if you wanted to know what distance was, right? You put your thumb over distance and it's time times speed. So distance is time times speed. If you know, if you want to know time, cover up time and it's distance divided by speed. If you want to know speed, you cover up speed and it's distance divided by time. It's just a little cute little thing to remember the relationships between distance, speed and time. Okay, so the reason I'm bringing this up is because we are interested in time, right? So the time it takes, the total time it's going to take is going to be the time it takes to row. The time it takes to row will be the distance she rows divided by, what's the speed she rows? Two. Two, Two miles per hour. Plus, the time it takes her to walk will be the distance she walks over the speed she walks. Do you understand I'm using this right here, this formula for time? The time is going to be the distance over the speed. So it's the distance she walks over the, the speed she walks, which is four miles per hour. Does that make sense, Samuel? Yes. Okay. You're off the hook. Christian, you're up. Christian, I need to figure out, we need to figure out two things, the distance she rows and the distance she walks. And this is the hard part, all right? Uh, the distance she walks is in blue. I'll do that. So I don't expect anything here, Christian, but do you have any idea how we might be able to figure out what this red line is? Would it be... So I was kind of, I was kind of doing it like, or I was thinking kind of like the bonus problem. I got the two pieces for the wire mm -hmm. or yeah, for laying the wire. So would B be, actually, I don't know anymore. Let, let me ask you this, Christian. If I label this red side, do you agree that red side is the distance she rose? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I would like to know if you can somehow tell me what that distance is she rose as a function of theta, because theta is what's determining her path. If theta is zero, do you agree she goes straight across? Yeah. And if theta is 90 degrees, then she's actually going to walk the whole way. Does that make sense to you? Theta is zero, she rows the whole time. Theta is pi over two or 90 degrees, she walks the whole way. Any theta in between there, it's gonna be a combination of rowing and walking. So Christian, I'm gonna help you. Do you know the, the length of that? The radius. It's the radius, two. that's two. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at that triangle. Theta, two, two. What do you know about this angle here? If it's these two sides are the same, theta. it's yeah. also theta, right? I'm just pointing that out. So is there anything that you know from anywhere in your past that somehow could connect these sides together? This, let's call this uh, D row, I'll leave it as D row. Is there anything that connects sides of not a right triangle, the sides of an arbitrary triangle to the angles. It'd be like sine, cosine, tangent. Okay. And then the other okay. angle would be, they all add up to 180. So it would they all be, add up to be 180. Yeah. You're, you're thinking right, but I'm saying, is there some formula from pre-cal that connects the sides of a triangle to the angles of a triangle. And we're not talking about right triangles. This is not a right triangle. Oh, you're right, you're right. Oh. Right? 
So let's go to our formula sheets. Question. What's your question, Cody? Well, I was going to throw out a guess. Yeah, law of sines or cosines, but Jair beat me to it. So law of sines relates relates an angle A, which would be this angle over its side, has to be equal to angle B over its side. Law of cosines relates all the sides and the angle together. So let's look at the law of cosines. I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna grab the whole thing. I'm gonna grab everything here. I wanna show us that this can, this is gonna work. Uh, notes. Um, I'm gonna try and slap it in right here. Yeah, I knew that would happen. Okay, I'm gonna have to make that smaller. And we need to be able to read it. So come on, come on, move. Here's what I'll do. I'll put that there. Let me take our picture right here. No, oh, I can just grab. Can I grab that for one moment? Okay, there we go. So <clears throat> we have three sides of a triangle, don't we? Well, we don't have that one, but there are three sides, right? And we have two angles that we know are, are theta. So here's what we're gonna do. Let's call this side A, this side B, this side C. This would be angle capital C, this would be angle capital A, and this would be angle capital B right there. So angle A, angle C, angle B, side A, side B, side C. So I'm going to use, let's see, we know, we know capital A and capital C, so I'm gonna just, I'm gonna go with this one. And I'm just gonna write that equation down, you ready? A squared would be what for us? Four. Four must equal B squared. What's that? We don't know. The distance we row. Well, yeah. Right? Squared plus C squared. What's C squared? Four. Four minus two times what? Distance we row. Okay, which is B, right? Right. Times right. C, which is two. Two, and then cosine of two. Uh, no, or no the cosine angle, of theta, sorry. The angle A, which is theta. Y'all agree with that? So let's see what happens here. Fours cancel. So we get zero equals the distance we row squared. Uh, what? Distance we row squared minus four. Yeah, four D row cosine theta. D row cosine of theta. Y'all okay with this? I know it seems like, what the hell are we doing? Where are we going with this? But we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out if we can find an expression for the distance we row as a function of theta. Because like I said, once you, once you fix theta, right? Give me a theta and then that distance you row is fixed, whatever, it depends on theta. So I'm trying to find a, a, a formula for distance we row. So right now, notice that both of these terms have distance we row in them. So I'm going to factor out distance we row and I'll be left with distance we row minus four cosine theta. So I factor out a distance we row from here and a distance we row from here. This is what I'm left with. And these are both set equal to zero. So I set each one of these equal to zero. Distance we row, equals zero or distance we row minus four cosine theta equals zero. 
This first equation I'm going to throw away. And the reason I'm throwing it away is because the dis if the distance we row is zero, what would that correspond to up here? If we row nothing, we would walk the whole way. We walk the whole way, right? We walk the whole way. So the distance we row equals zero. I'm going to throw out. This one says the distance we row is four cosine theta. Okay, we have a relation. We know what distance we row is. The distance we row is four times cosine of theta. Okay, that was just the distance we row. So I'm gonna be able to replace this just so we know what we're doing here. This is gonna be able to be replaced with four cosine theta. Now we need the distance we walk. And the distance we walk is the blue piece. So let me go to the next person here. Naja, are you there? Yes, sir. You have a headache yet? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Okay, so this right here, Naja, this is what we need to come up with a formula for. Mm -hmm. And again, if, if we choose what theta is, this thing is going to be fixed, right? Once I fix that theta, that's gonna be fixed. I should have shown you all my animation because with my animation, I can, I can show you what I mean by once you fix the theta, then everything else is fixed, right? I just had one question about the walk. We yeah. could use like arc, the arc length formula for that, could we? I don't think so. No, that's, well, that's what I was hoping Naja would get us. You I can apologize. Do, it's okay. But now you've given Naja the hint. So this is an arc length. Okay, so Naja, do you recall from pre-cal at all what the formula for an arc length of, of a circle is? Barely. Do you have your formula sheets? Maybe it's on your formula sheets. I do. Just give me one second. It's hidden here in the trigonometry section, page two. Look at the top left. Oh, for the um, angle measurement? Yep, you see this? Yep, an angle measurement. You see that S equals R theta. Yes, I see that. That's the relationship between an arc length, so how long this is, and the radius and the angle. Okay, so S equals R theta is our, is our key formula for this next part. With me, Naja? Yes. Okay, now we have a problem, Naja, because if you use that formula, we know the radius, right? We can see that the radius from here to here and here to here, that's two, right? Mm -hmm. But do you see, Naja, that the angle that we need to be talking about is this angle, I'm gonna call it alpha. It's not this angle. Go back to the formula sheet. See, if your arc is here, the theta is from the center of the circle out to the edge. In our picture, it's the center of the circle out to the edge is this angle, not this angle. And do you see that these are not the same? Yes. You agree they're not the same? Yes. Okay. So does anyone have a question? Does anyone have a question right now on this part? Like where we are, what we're doing? Right now, Naja, would you agree with this? that the distance we walk, which is the blue part here, should be equal to two alpha. Yes. Two is the radius. So R theta, this is really R theta, but theta for us is alpha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I have to show y'all something that you probably have never seen before. Even in pre-cal, you probably have never seen this, okay? So this is, most of the time news to you, news to students. If you have a circle, okay? If you have a circle, this is really cool property of circles. If you take a point from the center, okay? And you pick any two points on the circle, doesn't matter where they are, okay? And then you, you connect those together. You will get some angle, we'll call it alpha, 
right? There we go. Now, if you pick any other point on the circle, doesn't matter where it is. I'll pick it right, I'll pick it right here. If you draw me from those same two points down to here, oh, straight to there, this angle here is half of alpha, always. It will always be half of alpha. Let me show you a different, another picture. Let's say I take, this is, this will be really cool if you see it this way. Let's say I take this circle and I pick a point here and here. So I connect straight line there to there like that. Then what's this angle right here? 180. 180. Now, if I pick any other point on the circle, it doesn't matter where it is. And I connect those two points to that, guess what that angle is? 90. 90. Now, some of you may recognize this. I'm not a Star Trek fan, but I've heard um, that that's the Star Trek symbol. Something like this. Hold on, that's not it. Hold on, it's something else. Maybe it is that. Hmm. I don't know, sir. Someone may have been messing with you. I think maybe someone was. I think it's an adaptation of it. Do you all see it from right here? It's like two points on a circle. This point goes to the center. This point's on the edge. It's the same sort of idea, but I thought it was for sure that's where they got it from. So it's either a rough, a rough relation well, or a subtle a manipulation. Doesn't change anything. So with that in mind, okay, now that you have that knowledge, okay, Naja, if this is theta, then what's alpha? Oh, sorry, uh, it broke out for me. Could you repeat that? Okay, so given this this relationship, that if this is if this angle is alpha, this would have to be half of alpha. Mm -hmm. Then, if we're looking at this picture, if this is theta, then how, what is alpha in terms of theta? Is it um, two times theta? Twice theta, exactly. It's twice theta. So this alpha is actually two theta because this angle should be half of that. So the distance we walk will actually be two times two times theta, which is just four theta. And that means that this is four theta. I realized that this is a complicated problem. That's why it's number 38 in the book, okay? It's one of the harder problems in, the, in there. I'm not, not intending on giving this to you as like, your, like the problem on a, on a final, but this gives you some idea of how, com how complex this stuff can get. All right, can I proceed? Is everyone all right with me moving on? Because we're not, I mean, we're not doing the problem, but. Okay, so here's, here's where we are. I'm gonna clean this up. The total time it's gonna take us to take her to do this trip will be the distance she rows, which is four cosine theta divided by two. So that's just two cosine theta plus four theta divided by four, which is just theta. And now my time is a function of a single variable theta. There it is. Do we have a restriction on theta? What would be the smallest theta would be? Zero. Could it be zero? zero. Yeah, zero. Could it be? Yeah. Well, like yeah, what? because cosine of zero is one. Zero right there, and she's rowing the whole way, right? Yeah. The other extreme would be straight no. up, which means she's walking the whole way. Pi over two. So our restriction is a closed interval between zero and pi over two. And you must use radians here, don't use degrees. But now it's derivative time. You all ready? This is closed interval method. This should be nice. What is the derivative of this? Yeah, negative two cosine, or negative two sine theta. 
plus plus one one we're taking the derivative of this with respect to theta so we're just going to get that when is this zero let's see set that equal to zero and let's move things around um, negative two sine theta equals negative one so sine theta is a half And where is sine theta? At what angle is theta is sine theta one half? Is it going to be pi over six and five pi over six, or seven pi over six? Yes, yes, but we are restricted between zero. Oh, and five right, right, two, right, right. So there is only one answer. Theta is pi over six. Any questions? We're almost there. Because this is a closed interval, I don't need a number line, okay? I don't need a number line. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find, um, I'm gonna take the original time function, not the derivative, and I'm gonna plug in the endpoint zero, pi over two, and then the critical point we got, which was pi over six, and figure out what we get. So we'll probably need a calculator for this. Um, T of zero is gonna be two cosine of zero, uh, plus zero, cosine of zero is one, so this should be two. The next one is two cosine of pi over two plus theta, which is pi over two. Cosine of pi over two is zero, so all you're gonna be left with is pi over two here. And the last one is two cosine of pi over six plus pi over six. And that equals, what is cosine of pi over six? Isn't that like radical three over two? Root three over two. So this is two times root three over two plus pi over six. So this is root three plus pi over six. So I'm going to figure out what these are. This is two is two. This is about 1.57. And this is about, All right, Daniela, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, we have three answers. Okay. So the question was asking originally, um, a woman wants to get from point A to point C, right? And she wants to do it in the shortest time possible. She can walk this rate and she can row the boat this rate. How should she proceed? Your answers are these three times, okay? So which time is the smallest there? 1.57, right? Okay, yeah. so that's the shortest way, but that corresponds to what angle? What angle gives you this time? Then um what did we plug what did we plug in to get 1.57? Pi over two. Pi over two, right? So in our picture, remember the angle, the angle is this right here. Yeah. In order to get the shortest time, it needs to be pi over two. Go ahead. What does that mean? Straight up would be pi over two, right? This angle right here would be pi over two. So what is that telling us that she needs to do? To walk? Walk the whole way. Walk. 
If she gets on that boat, it's going to take her longer. Yeah. So just walk. All right. There's no, there's no combination in between. In fact, if you look at our answers, 2.26 is not a minimum. It's a maximum, isn't it? And that happens at pi over six. So if she wants to actually take her time, right? Enjoy the scenery. Then she should go to pi over six. There it is. I have it programmed on the computer right there. If she aims at pi over six, goes across, and then walks the rest of the way, that will take her the longest amount of time. If she wants a minimum, shortest distance, she's going to walk the whole way. Cody, is your hand up, Cody, or no? No, I'm just, I have stretched like that. I'm sorry. No, no, your, your digital hand. Oh, I had that up earlier, but I, know I, you had it earlier. I never forgot about it. I never, I never pay attention. So I don't even know how to reset it. I just have to do lower I, it myself. I, do I reset it? No, no, I lower it whenever I guess I feel like. Try it like again. Try it again. Too. Raise your hand again. All right. All right. I never do this. So you see, I think I can. Oh, I can lower your hand. You know, that explains a lot of times where my hand was mysteriously lowered in other classes. Yeah. The dastardly people. All right. That was complicated. Yes. That was complicated. All right, this last problem that we're not going to do um, has to, this is a classic problem, like most calculus students see this problem. Um, I would encourage you to um, try that problem yourself just for fun. Let me see if I can get to, I'll get to the book so that you can see it. I'll put it up here for you. We're going to take a little, we're going to take a little break because um, it's already 2.50. Let me see here. Like I said earlier, I mean, we could sit here and do optimization problems for the rest of the semester. We could. Uh, number 26. Oh, wait, no, it was 38. 26. Oh, that's the, it says the wrong thing there. No, that's not it. Yeah, this is a good one. I just want to put it here because this is the type of problem that I think every student should mess with when you're doing optimization. So the idea here is that you have a sphere and this sphere has a fixed radius, okay? So it's fixed, okay? That sphere is not moving. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna try and put a cylinder inside of the sphere and you're gonna inscribe it, which means that the top of the cylinder is going to touch the sphere, right? It's gonna touch and then come down and it's gonna touch here. And what you're trying to do is find the largest volume of a cylinder you can get in there. The thing is the the taller you make it, the taller you make the cylinder, the more narrow it has to become to touch. And the wider you make it, right, the shorter it has to become. So if you made a really wide cylinder, it would look like this. So you have to mess with the geometry of this problem to figure out like what's the optimal way, what's the biggest cylinder you can get in there. Would you all, I, I, I would offer that as a bonus. The problem is that's like a classic problem. Everyone's just gonna be able to look it up and just get an answer. And it's, I challenge you to work that yourself, see how much you can do, okay? I'll give you a hint though. You're gonna need to cut it in half and look at a cross section. Cut it and look at it from like, you know, cut it, cut it in half, open it up and look at it from the side. And, and that'll help you get the geometry of it down. Okay, let's take our break. Uh, 10 minutes, nine minutes, nine minutes.
Oh, are you there, Cody? So, Cody, you read that new one-shot by the Chainsaw Man guy? Okay, there's a new one-shot chapter out from Chainsaw Man? No, 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 no. It's a one-shot. It's like a standalone story from the dude that made Chainsaw Man. Oh, okay. Oh, man. That makes me sad, dude. Chainsaw Man was so good, but it ended so quickly, gonna... it felt like. No, he's going to continue it. It's going to continue afterwards, like huh. he said that. Oh, really? But okay, it was I like he just, a, uh, he just did a one-shot. That was pretty good. It's like about this yeah. girl that draws manga growing up. It's like pretty sad. I'm like the the, the new manga I'm really watching out for is it's called Chojin X. It's from Ishida Sui, the author of Tokyo Ghoul. So. Oh yeah, I read that because he it was a one shot of that too, right? At first, and then I think he's actually started. Well, he or she. We actually don't have a gender for Ishida Sui. Not that it doesn't matter. I'm just saying, you know. Uh, I'm, I've been conditioned to think proper pronouns. So, um, 
Yeah, either way, they're, I, it started as one shot, and I think they started to serialize things, but it was – I don't interesting. know. Interesting. I wasn't. Yeah, I don't. I'm not 100 percent sold on the topic for I it. Just, like it's. I, I didn't like how in the first chapter the main character already looks like some watered down version of Kaneki's Kakuja form. It was like, what? Like, how are we here already? Come on. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. But yeah, I wasn't a huge fan of the how it looked, and like how the story was already going. Like it wasn't super crazy. I just enjoyed the artwork for, like, at least the Tokyo Gold artwork. Like, that was the, the manga, one, like, strong. Tokyo Gold manga. I actually have the uh, original uh, original art used in the anime. Oh, in my, really? Yeah, in the case over there. The Genga used to animate Tokyo Ghoul. Hmm. A bunch of Kaneki ones. Oh, I was going to tell you, too. I went to the, I was at the pet shop on Hebner and Bandera, and I saw they have this, like, anime otaku cafe there now. So yeah, they moved it. That. It was originally it was originally on uh, San Pedro. Uh, Bro, I went I, there a lot. I felt so out of place. I walk in, hairy guy with a beard and a Harley shirt, and it's just like everybody <laughs> looking at me. I'm like, I promise I belong. I know I don't look like it, but I belong. I promise. All right, everyone. So this is like bonus material. I don't always get to talk about Newton's method. A lot of times I run out of time. I think we're going to have enough time for this. So. Um, this is a method that was developed by Isaac Newton to uh, solve equations. So remember, we were working a problem a moment ago where we kind of had to wave our hands at that equation. Where was it? Right. And then we just went to the computer and it gave us an answer, 2.492. And we were happy with that. We moved on, right? So what happened? How did the computer get that answer, right? How did it do it? I'm gonna show you, it's actually brilliant, all right? So what, what we're looking right now, what we're looking at right now is for this specific example is we're trying to figure out how to solve this equation, um, x squared um, minus two equals zero, okay? So, so what if we were faced with, with that equation? Solve x squared minus two equals zero. Now, we, we all know how to solve this algebraically, right? We could just like take the two to the other side and then we take the square root on both sides and we get plus or minus the square root of two, which is approximately equal to plus or minus 1.414, blah, 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 it keeps going, okay? That's how we would do that algebraically and we're all, we're all happy about that, okay? But if I go to Wolfram Alpha right now and I ask it to solve that, it's gonna give us those same answers. So what's it doing, right? It's not sitting there saying, oh, I'm gonna move the two to the other side and then take the square root of both sides. That's not what Wolfram Alpha is doing. So how does Wolfram Alpha approach this? So I, I will show you eventually how it does it, but I want us to conceptualize this. What we're really doing here is we're taking this and we're treating it like a function of X, the left side of this equation. And we're setting it equal to zero. Okay, that's what this is which corresponds to the x-intercepts of f, right? That's the x-intercepts. That's anytime we want to find x-intercepts of a function, we just set the function equal to zero. So what we're doing here is we're imagining that we have this parabola and it goes like this. And we're trying to figure out these two points. So I want us to just isolate all of our thinking right now to this one point right here. And I actually need to redraw the graph. So I'm gonna exaggerate it so it makes this easier for me. Okay. So we're trying to figure out where it crosses the x-axis. So here was Newton's idea. Newton said, well, here's one way I could approach this. I could just pick a random point, okay? Like a guess as to what the answer is. So let me say, like, we know the answer is really like 1.414, but maybe we could pick um, three, okay? Now we know three is not going to give us zero when we plug it in, right? Three is not gonna give us zero when we plug it into that function. But what it will do is it'll spit out a point right here, right? And it'll give us that point. Now, what we've learned in calculus is that we can find the equation of that tangent line through that point, right? Haven't we learned that? I give you a function, I say, hey, go find the equation of the tangent line. You could go find the equation of this line right here. Right? Now, that equation, 
that you find is going to look like y equals mx plus b, isn't it? It's going to be a line. That's the equation of a line. Now, couldn't you tell me then, once you have this, this is a line, couldn't you find the x-intercepts of that, of that line? How do you find the x-intercepts of a line? You Set replace y, y with zero. zero and solve for x, right? Now that would give me this point right here. Do y'all see that point? I'm gonna highlight it there in yellow. That would give me that point. Do you see that that point is closer to the real answer than three was? So what I do now with that point is I do the same process and I plug that into the function. I get another point and then I find the equation of that tangent line. And do you see how that's even closer? And then I take that answer, find the x-intercept, plug that in, and do it again and again and again. So here's the, that same idea done better with a picture, OK? So we have that parabola. I'm going to pick a point here, go up to the function, find the equation of the tangent line. That gives me a second point. I take that, plug that in. That point goes in, get an equation of that tangent line. That gives me another point down here. I do it again. Third time. Now let me zoom in so you can see that. So you see here, I've zoomed in. We're doing it again, go up. And now look how damn close we are to that, right? We're really close to that x-intercept. So we do it again. You're not even able to see it. So I'm gonna zoom really, really far in. Okay, there, it's, you can just barely see we're really close. And I can just keep on doing this and keep doing it and doing it and doing it. Understand? So let me go back to the beginning. Let me zoom out. When I first started, I plugged in three, right? So the first point I'm starting with is 3.00000. When I do the first iteration of this, it gives me a new point right here. And that point is the point 1.8333. That's this point. I do it another time. Now this new point is the point 1.4621221. Do you see where it's headed? Started at three. Now it's marching its way towards getting closer, 1.4149988, do it again, 1.4142137880, do it again, I'll do it eight times, 1.4142135622, do you see that? Now, what is the square root of two on my, cal I'm gonna do it on my calculator. Um, the square root of two, well, my calculator is only set to go um, so many decimal places. Let me go to Wolfram Alpha and I'll do square root of two. Um, root two, okay. Root two, all right. Let me, let me copy this. Uh, you know what? I'm not gonna be able to copy that. Yeah, I'll do it. I'll copy it. And paste it over here. This is Wolfram Alpha's answer. And then me doing this process, and it's hard to see this, but I'll try. This is, the, this is what I got on the computer on mine. So let's see what matches. 414-2156-2373-90-50488-0168872-420968-596. Up, oh, 9807856961875377. Damn, we match. We match all the way to here. That's how accurate I am. How many decimal places is that? I don't even know. It's like 30 decimal places or something. So right now I've got the answer, square root of two, accurate out to like 30 or 40 decimal places. I mean, maybe it's not 30, 20 something, okay? Which in the real world, look, I mean, I've said this before. In the real world, you'll, you can only be as accurate as like what you're trying to build, right? Like you're trying to machine a, a bearing. There's a certain tolerances that you can machine it at. Like most of the time you, you can only go out to like, you know, thousands or ten thousandths of an inch. So if I get it accurate out 20 decimal places, that's more than enough. So maybe, maybe I don't have it perfect all the way down, but I have it close enough. All right. That's pretty cool, right? That idea. So now I want to show you how you do it, actually, like how we would come up with the formula for it. So see if you can follow this. All right. At the end of when I'm done with this, I'm just going to give you a formula. So you don't need to necessarily follow this, but let's say we're trying to find this x-intercept, right? That's the question. So I start off out here with a guess. 
okay? This is my guess. I'm gonna call it X sub zero. That's my guess, okay? Now, when I take X sub zero, I'm gonna plug it in here and I'm gonna get a point up here. Now remember, everyone, F, the function is given to us, okay? The function is given to us. So someone has to hand us the function we're trying to find the x-intercepts of. So this point that I have here actually has an x and a y coordinate. The x coordinate is x sub zero, and the y coordinate is whatever you get when you plug that into the original function. Do you all agree? Yes? Now we have the equation of a tangent line. Or sorry, we have a tangent line here. What is the equation of this? Well, we know it's y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, right? Do we know the y1 and x1 for this red line? The, the uh, x is zero, then f of x is zero. Yeah, so the y, this is our, this is our x1, y1, right? That's what that is up here. So I know that this is y minus f of x sub zero equals, I'll leave m for a second, and then this is x minus x sub zero. So I'm just replacing y1 with that point and x1 with that point. Now, what is the slope of that line? This is the critical part. What's the slope of that tangent line? The derivative of the function. It's the derivative of the function where though? At what, where are we evaluating? At x zero. Good, at x sub zero. That's the slope of the line, right? Understand? Y'all okay with this? Okay, this is the equation of the tangent line. Now, please, somebody tell me how I can now find this point. What is that? That's what on the, equa that's what on the equation of the tangent line. That point is what part of the equation, of, or what part of that tangent line? Your x-intercept? The x-intercept. So how would you find the x-intercept of this line? What would you do? Set it equal to zero. Replace the y with zero, right? You'd say, okay, when is y zero here? So if I go to find the x-intercept of this, right? That will be this point, okay? That's this point right here. And to do it, I replace y with zero. Okay. You all right with that? And what are we supposed to do with this? Remember, x x zero is a number, right? That's a number. So that's a number. When I take the derivative and plug that number in, that's a number. And then when I plug the um, number x sub zero into the original function, that's a number. So this is a number. That's a number. That's a number. And this is the x-intercept, right? That's the actual x-intercept. So let's solve for x right here. So watch what I do to solve for x. You ready? I'm gonna divide both sides by f prime of x sub zero. Cancels. So I get over here on the left side, negative f of x sub zero over f prime of x sub zero equals x minus x naught. And to solve for x, I'll add x to both sides. So I add x on the left and the right. So if I add x on the left, it becomes x sub zero minus f of x sub zero over f prime of x sub zero equals x. So look, Look at what we're saying. This is, this is the part that Newton was just brilliant on. You start at some point, okay? Just guess whatever point you want. The next point, after you do this thing where the, the point goes up, you get the line and then you set it equal to zero. To get that next point, this is the formula for it. So this right here will be this point. Let's call this point something. Let's call that point X sub one because this was our starting point. So this is our formula for x sub one. Okay, so 
this is, think of this computer science people, okay? Because this is all about computer science um, approach here. Think about what we have. We're gonna guess an X naught, right? We're going to then use this formula, right? Copy. We're going to now use that formula to get a new point. And then we do it again. Okay. So if you want to know what X2 is, X2 should be everything we just did, but on X1. So it should be X sub one minus the function at X sub one over the derivative at X sub one. That'll be your second point. And then your third point will be the second point minus the function at the second point over the derivative at the second point. And then your third point will be the, does this make sense? It's just, it's an algorithm. You're just gonna to continue to run this algorithm over and over and over. So Newton's method, the way it's presented in a textbook is as follows. And normally they don't, Normally they don't go into the explanation, but there it is. So like I said, if we wanted the first point, we would take the initial point and subtract the function evaluated at the initial point over the derivative at that initial point. This is saying, if you want the n plus one point, you take the previous point, the function evaluated at the previous point, divide it by the derivative at the previous point, and that will get you that next point. And you just keep running this over and over and over. Okay. So is there a rule to like figure out when you're like pretty good with the uh the guess? Like when to stop? Yeah. Yeah. So the guess can actually screw you up. But the what the computer does is it tries to like it'll take the function, like whatever the function you give it, like if it was um, x squared minus two, like the one we were looking at a minute ago. It'll just guess two points. So maybe it, it'll guess, maybe it'll go like F of zero. It'll plug that in, it'll get negative two. Then it'll say F of maybe 10. And if you do that, you're gonna get 98. And then your computer says, ah, look, it changed signs. It went from negative to positive. So it knows it's close, right? And then what it can do is say, all right, let me guess something between zero and 10. Now, if you start running the algorithm, and your numbers don't start getting closer and closer to something, then the computer will stop and it'll say, wait a minute, something's not wrong. I need a different guess. These are all things that a computer programmer would have to think about. This is like how you program it. So I actually wrote the program for it, okay, to do it because I thought it'd be worth showing just how simple it is. It's a, it's a very simple, um, I'm doing this in, in what would be referred to as like C plus. So first thing I'm doing is I am, I am putting M right here. I know this is not written. Computer science people know that your, your programs are supposed to somehow like, you're supposed to have lines of code that tell you what each like, like part of the code is doing. Okay, this is- At the I'm very beginning, right. yeah. Okay, right. Um, so here, this is just, this is, this is me telling it how many, how many actual iterations I want it to do. So I want it to apply Newton's method four times. And then I tell it it's a for loop, okay? And then within the for loop, there's a do loop. So I say, okay, for i equals one, and I'm gonna do this until i reaches the maximum, which is four. And then I wanna increment, every time I run the for loop, I want the increment of i to go up by one. Again, this is computer science people, if you coded, you, you know what this kind of is, right? Then couldn't I you just do i? Pardon? Oh, no, couldn't you just do i is uh, less than or equal to uh, four? Because instead of just having to state the variable at the very yeah, end. I don't have to state it. It just makes it easy yeah. for me when I, when I, well, what I'm about to show you. Okay. So I can just change this real easily. So um, I define what the function is. So this is the function x squared uh, minus two. And then um, what is r is two? I forget what r is two is. Oh, this is my guess. Sorry. This is my guess. Let me start it at three. So that's like my initial point. And then I do a do loop and I say, okay, the new point is the previous point minus the original function evaluated at R divided by the derivative of the function evaluated at R. And then I want to print the answer. So I want it to show me the answer correct to 40 decimal places. 
And so I run, I run the program. If, if I only do it one time, right? If I only do it one time, it gives me, that means it, it took my guess three, it went up, drew a line and found me that point and it's 1.83. If I do it twice, it did 1.83 and then the next point was 1.462. If I do it three times, I get the 1.414 starting to get good. Do it four times. There we go. So you can see by looking at this, like these are the same, that's the same, that's the same. We have some variation here in the fourth decimal place. So I maybe need to run it another, another time. So when I run it that fifth time, let me just do it seven times. Okay, so on these, let me try and note where we have differences. So here we have a difference, but on the next one, we don't get a difference till here. And on this one, we don't have a difference till, I, I think I'm doing this right, till there. So what you're, what you're, uh, when you go to Wolfram Alpha and you type this in, you say solve, the program is pre-designed to stop running the loop when the difference between two answers is within a certain amount. So what they'll do is they'll say, take this answer, subtract that answer. If that answer is greater than 0. 0.000000 whatever one, then stop. If it's less than that, sorry, if it's less than some given tolerance, stop. I just have it doing it so many times. Uh, let me do, what would happen if, I'm guessing that if I do it just two more times, I'll have it correct to 40 decimal places. Yeah, look, 570, correct to 40. Let me go to 60 decimal places. Let's go crazy, let's go 80 decimal places. Look at this, on the ninth iteration, on the ninth iteration, I have the square root of two accurate out to 80 decimal places. See, there's no variation in this ninth, this eighth and ninth step. I mean, it get, you get to a point where you can get ridiculous with this, okay? Let me make this really small and let me do out 15. Let me do 15 iterations and let's go, let's go 160 decimal places. Oh shit, and we nailed it. I, I know that's hard to see, but we nailed it right here, like these are all the same. So that only took, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. It only took 10 iterations to get it accurate to 160 decimal places. I'm just having fun. Let me see. It's carrying on to the next screen. I can't quite fit it all on here, but it looks like right around here, these are the same. That's correct to 260 decimal places. A very powerful, a very, very powerful uh, formula, Newton's method. So I don't ask students, I do not ask students on a test to do, to solve a problem using Newton's method because Newton's method is not for humans. Newton's method is for machines, okay? That's what it's for. It's perfectly suited for a machine because it's just a, a for loop, do loop, whatever. You can do this different ways. But I went ahead and did the problem for us, the one that we got stuck on. So I did five iterations. Here's the, th the function I was trying to find the x-intercepts of. You go back, it was y cubed minus three y minus eight. And I started with a guess at two and I got it um, pretty accurate, 2.49, which is what we did, what we got, 2.49. We had that within the first couple of iterations. And if your guess is, let's say our guess was something else. Let's say our guess was 10. That's really far away from 2.49. Eh, 10, I need a couple more iterations. See that? It's like, it's, but it's not gonna take much more. I have there a question. <clears throat> eight, eight iterations and I've got it. Yes. So. You you, you're saying, I mean, I don't think, well, I mean, I'm just misunderstanding it, but Newton didn't design this for computers. It's just more ideal for a computer process. Yeah, did he, he just created an algorithm. He, right. he basically got what's called, he created a formula for what's called a recursive sequence. He right. created it's, a formula that creates a sequence of numbers and those numbers converge to the answer. Okay, so that's, that's what he contributed. 
he said this this is a this is a recursive sequence that will generate the solution. Now you, your guess has to be close enough and there are certain things that have to work a certain way, but, but yeah, he was not thinking computers. He was just thinking, you know, yeah. you could do this by hand. It's not impossible to do this by hand. It's just a pain in the ass. Okay, so he, he made the yeah. method and, and we figured out that it was just easier to let the computer do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, speaking of recursive sequences, you may or may not have ever seen this recursive sequence. We're getting off topic, but it's all right. Well, you have said have we you won't all be ever seen this, this recursive? I'm sorry? Sorry, I said you said we won't be tested on like 4.6 Newton's method. I'm not going to give you something to, you know, like solve this equation. I, no, use Newton's method to solve this. I, I won't give you that. Um, So we are going off topic here, but this is a this is a very famous recursive sequence. It creates a list of numbers. So the way it starts is your first number. Oh, actually, I need to change this three to a two. Sorry. Okay, so it says that x sub zero equals x sub one equals one. So that means x sub zero is one. X sub one is one also. Now, if you want to know what x sub two is. What is x sub two according to this formula? x sub two will be equal to what? x sub two Negative. minus one plus x sub two minus two. Do you all see how I'm using this formula? That's x sub one plus x sub zero, but what's x sub one plus x sub zero? One or two. One, one, two. one plus one, which is two. What would x sub three be? x sub three minus one plus x sub three minus two. That's x sub two plus x sub one. What's x sub two? Two. Two. What's x sub one? One. One. What's two plus one? Three. Anybody recognize this? The sequence goes like this. One, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, 34. Did you get that right? I think I got that right. You ever seen that before? I saw a couple of you raise your hand. Yes, Fibonacci. I think I spelled that right, Fibonacci. That's the Fibonacci sequence. Show of hands, how many of you have heard of the Fibonacci sequence? Yeah, a couple of you. It's, it's a, a famous sequence of numbers in, in math. All it is is every number is just the sum of the previous two. And you always start with one, one, and then now this one is just these two added. So two is one plus one. Three is two plus one. Five is three plus two. Eight is five plus three. 13 is eight plus five. 21 is 13 plus eight. Got it? You just keep on adding the previous two to get the next one. And this appears in um, different places. Um, time is at 3.30, we still have enough time. Okay, so um, I'm gonna draw you a square. Okay, that's a square, everybody. And what I'm gonna tell you is that the length of each side is one. So if I put a one in that box, that means it's a one by one by one by one square, right? One by one by one by one. Now I'm gonna put another square next to it. That's also one by one by one by one. You can tell because these sides match up. If I draw this square and I tell you it's a square, if I tell you that is a square, what number goes inside of it? So the number inside two. represents how long each side is. So two, two. Mm -hmm. okay. And if I draw a square over here, what number goes in there? Three. Three, right, the two here plus the one there, so three. And if I draw again, another square over here, that'll be one plus one plus the three, so that'll be five. 
If I draw another square over here, this will be the five plus the one plus the two, which will be eight. If I draw another one over here like this, then you get eight plus two plus three. So that gives you your 13. I'll do one more here to here. That's your 21. 13 plus three plus five. So this is the Fibonacci sequence. It's one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21. And if you start from the first square, this corner right here in the first square, and you connect to the opposite corner with an arc, and then from that square, connect to the opposite corner with an arc, and then from that square, the opposite corner with an arc, and that square with opposite corner with an arc, and then another arc like that, another arc like that, another arc like that, another arc like that, and you get what's called the golden spiral. Oh, spiral, I just remember it is golden ratio for some reason. It is also, the, the ratio of these numbers is approaching what's called the golden ratio. Oh, okay. So there's, this is debatable. I've seen different things on this. When I was taught the Fibonacci sequence and the golden spiral and golden ratio, I was told that this, sort of spiral appears in nature in many places. That, you know, think about like a, a seashell. Let me see if we can look at a seashell. What kind of images we get here? I think it's funny the gas stations pop up for you. Let me see, seashell. Oh, here we go, here's a good one. So if you look at this seashell, if you start in the center and you start going out with this spiral out like this, notice that that spiral, it's packed in tighter in the center. And then as you go out, the, the distance between each, each uh, curve, the, the curves are spreading out, right? It's not like this. This is a way I could draw a spiral where the distance between each curve stays the same. I'm trying, it's hard here. So the distance between each of these uh, curves stays the same the whole time. In nature, it actually, these spirals appear and they spread out, they get bigger, bigger as you go out, right? And that's what the Fibonacci spiral here, this golden ratio, golden spiral is doing also. So we find that in nature, a lot of things follow this sort of golden spiral. Now I've heard that, but I've heard more recently that that's kind of a bunch of bullshit and that we're looking too hard to match something up that it doesn't have to be the golden spiral. So I've heard it debated both ways, but I think it's interesting either way. Okay, that's it. That's all I wanna say about Newton's method. Newton's method is an algorithm that you can program into a computer to solve equations, all right? Have you, I'm just curious, have you ever like applied the Fibonacci sequence to things like the the famous breakdown, like the Mona Lisa that has the Fibonacci sequence, all that jazz. I don't even know how that really works. I was just- I have see. not personally um, done anything with it. I mean, other than what mathematicians do, um, but I've heard that there are different things. Um, I think, was someone in this class asking me about it? I thought, who was it? I don't know why Samuel's name is coming to mind. Samuel, you didn't ask me about it, right? Like you work with Fibonacci stuff? No, I didn't. I have a student that texted me, they're in my Cal 2. It might've been my online class. It was my online Cal 2, that's right. Because in that class, we talk about sequences. And um, I guess he does like finance and stuff for a living and they do these things called Fibonacci tables. So he was asking about a correlation and, and I looked into it and I couldn't really speak to it. So I personally have not used the Fibonacci for anything other than demonstrating. The thing about Fibonacci that's kind of lame to me is that the way Fibonacci works, you know, you start out with one, one, and then you go, what, the next number is two, and then you add the previous two is three, next one's five. Well, I mean, why, why do it that way? Like, why not start with, uh, why, don't, why don't you start with like one, three, and do the same thing? And then say the next one's four, and then the next one's seven, the next one's 11, right? Next one's 18. That's a different sequence, right? It just had different initial starting things, right? Instead of one, one is one, three, or why not start with something like negative two, eight, 
And then, I don't know, instead of adding them, why don't you multiply them? You know what I'm saying? Like, it, there's nothing uniquely awesome about Fibonacci. It's just one way you can generate a sequence. It, it, mathematicians think about, think, think about it that way. Why not do this? Why not have a sequence where I go one, 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 and then the next number is just the first three added. So now you get three. And now I add the previous three. So three, one, and one, that would give me five. And now the next one would be five, three, and one, that would give me nine, right? So like, why start with one, one, and why just add those? Why not start with two different numbers and add them or subtract them or multiply them? Do you see that it, nothing really too special about it in, in terms of sequences? Mm -hmm. Y'all look thrilled. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm, if I'm being honest, I just keep remembering the Criminal Minds episode that had the Fibonacci sequence in it. And like, so yeah. I'm... Yeah, I think, I think that, um, I think that, I think that the, you know, Hollywood does things with math things and they just kind of like, I actually wanted to tell you about this. I, I was so excited because like, you know, like on the TV shows when they have like all the, like they'll have the person that's supposed to be a, a genius or something like that. And they'll have all the math formulas behind them for like their moment where they're thinking. I realized half of that stuff is just derivative stuff. They have like derivative <laughs> things stuck in there. And I was like, oh my gosh, I know now. Yeah. I was, I was so excited. Now I'm not, I'm not a big fan. I'm not a big fan. I, I just never really had the time to watch The Simpsons. But from what I know about Simpsons, the writers of the Simpsons were very, very deliberate to put like real mathematical stuff into their shows. And so like, it's pretty mind boggling if, if you just, if, I don't know, Simpsons and math, let's just see. Uh, what is this crap? They have it in different places in the in the show where they bring up math. Yeah, I'm not going to go too far down this rabbit hole, but um, but like it's legitimate math. It's not just like crazy symbols thrown up there just to kind of like make people think it's complicated. You know what I'm saying? It's same with like Goodwill Hunting. Have you all seen that movie Goodwill Hunting? There's a yeah. uh, there's a web, there's a YouTube channel called Number File. If you've ever watched that, it's awesome. If you're mathy, it's called Number File. And uh, they talk about um, the problems that, you know, there's a chalkboard out on the, in the hallway. And, and then like the janitor guy, the main character would like go solve these complicated MIT problems, right? Like in this, on this uh, YouTube channel, they, they talk about those problems and they actually show like how easy most of them are. If you actually know what's being asked, they're not hard problems. So that's an example of where the math was not exactly, um, well, they thought it through, but they didn't care too much to make it really, really hard math. They just, let's just put something complicated. People won't know what it is. <sighs> okay, let's move on. All right, so we've reached a good point in the class now we are kind of done with derivatives and we are ready to start going backwards now. Okay, so everything, everything we've been done, doing has been moving forward. Okay, derivatives was a process. We've learned how to, we learned how to crawl. We learned how to walk. We've even learned how to run a little bit with derivatives, okay? We, we should at this point feel pretty comfortable with all the rules. Now what we need to do is see, can we go backwards? Okay, can we start moving everything in the reverse direction? And that is very difficult to do in general. And the reason is because all these rules that we had, product, quotient, and chain were so complicated that if you ever wanna go backwards and undo them, it just becomes very difficult. So what, what my goal in this for the rest of our time together, which is gonna be just what's left today and then uh, Thursday and Tuesday, it's just to see how far we can go with antiderivatives. And a lot of that's gonna depend on your comfort level with it, okay? If the class feels pretty good, we'll just keep going. Because the more you see, the better you'll be for Cal 2, but um, we'll have plenty of time to cover what I wanna cover. All right, so this is a lot of definitions, all right? There's a lot of things here that I don't want you to sit here and copy down. You have access to these notes. 
Um, 4.7 is called antiderivative. So let's just get the definition of an antiderivative out of the way. So a function capital F, notice it's a capital F, is called an, an, an antiderivative of a little f on some interval i if the derivative of capital F is little f. All right, what the hell does that mean? Okay, so we're saying that if we have some function, let's say capital F of X, I'm gonna just make it up X squared. This function is called an antiderivative of little f if when I take the derivative of that, I get little f. So do you all agree just by what I've written up written here that this capital F function is, the, is an antiderivative of little f? Because if I take the derivative of capital F, I get little f, right? If I take that one's derivative, I get that, right? So to be an antiderivative of something means that when you take the derivative of it, you get back the original function. I'll give you another example. This one will be harder. How about I give you a little f? What if I give you this? I'll make it find an antiderivative. So I'm giving you a little f, and I'd like for you to tell me a capital F that would be considered to be an antiderivative. And let's let's just go through names today. Cruz, Cruz, can you give me an antiderivative of the of the little of the function little f of x equals one? Would you just go with x? X. There you go. X. Right. So Cruz, all you're thinking, what you should be thinking, Cruz, right, is what do I take the derivative of to get one, right? Yeah. So x, exactly. x would work, right? That's an antiderivative. All right, um, Cruz, I'm going to stick with you. Can you give me another one? Can you give me another antiderivative? Just one again? Yeah, for that when you take the derivative of it, you will get one. But I don't want you to give me the same answer. I want you to give me something a little different. Mm. So it's it's almost so easy, it's confusing. Mm -hmm. But let me ask you this, Cruz. What do you what is it that we take the derivatives of? And when we do it, they just go away. Like it goes, when you take derivative of something, it just, gone, it just vanishes. A constant? A constant, right? So give me, give me another version of capital F that would have a constant with it, like x plus whatever you want, Cruz. Three. Three. Would that still be an antiderivative? Oh, I see what you're saying. You see okay. it, right? Yeah. That I would still that. be an antiderivative, right, everyone? Because when you take the derivative of that, you still get one. Yeah, the three okay. has no impact on the derivative. Now, these two are not the same functions. Keep in mind, those aren't the same. Mm -hmm. Those are both antiderivatives, though, because when you take derivative of both of them, you get one. And Cruz, you could keep going now, right? I mean, I could just keep asking you for the rest of your life until you die to keep giving me antiderivatives. And all you have to do is just keep on tacking numbers on, right? You just, right? You yeah. never run out of functions. There's there's an infinite number of these, right? So could you just try to- Infinite number of antiderivatives. Is there a question there? Yeah, I was gonna just ask if you can try to, uh, capital F of X is equal to X plus C, C for constant. Yeah, so in general, in general, we want a way of sort of classifying all of these. Let me, let me get back to Cruz. Cruz, if I put an X squared here on any of these, it would not work, right? No. Right, they all have to have x, and it can't be x squared, it can't be x cubed, it has to be x, and then all of them can have any number attached through addition or subtraction, right? So no matter how we do it, an antiderivative of this 
must look like this, X plus a constant, capital C. Now keep in mind, capital C can be either a positive or negative number. It doesn't have to be plus five. It could be minus five also. This is what's referred to as the general antiderivative. Because it actually, uh, it actually includes everything in here, right? It covers all of these functions. So what we like to say is that this is a family of functions. It's a family of functions. They are different functions, right? We, x, x plus three, x plus seven, x minus four. Those are all different. They don't look exactly the same but they all look like lines, right? They're all lines. They all have a slope of one. It's just, they're just moved up or down, right? That's all, that's all they are. And I want you to think about this visually. If, if we were to take any of these functions, any of them and graph them, let's graph one. That would be this first one, right? This one would be X plus three. So we move that line up one, but it's parallel. This one would be plus seven. So we move that up. There, this would be minus four, so it'd be down here. Oh, that's not really parallel. Oh, <laughs> okay. See, all of these functions have something in common. If you were to take the derivative, go to, in, go to any point, okay? I don't care what point, take the derivative on all of these functions at that point. What can you tell me the value of the derivative is at every single one of those points? What's the slope of the tangent line? One. one, right? One, 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 one. That's what we're looking for. When we're given a function little f and asked to find the antiderivative, we're asking to find the family of functions that give you the same slopes of tangent lines no matter where you are. Let's do another one. That was that was basic example. And this is going to be pretty basic for a while. All right, so. Let's do another one. How about this? What if I tell you little f of x equals uh, 2x? We're going to go baby steps here. And so I want, uh, let's see, who's next? Justin, you're up. You there, Justin? Yes, sir. I would like for you to give me a specific example of an antiderivative of this function. All right. Uh, x squared. Okay. Specific. Give no. me another one. X squared plus one. Okay. One more. X squared plus five. Okay. How about this? Would this work? Justin? X squared plus E. Is E a number? Just by itself, E? I mean... 2.718, right? E to the first power. So that would yeah. also work, right? Um, X squared plus pi would work. X squared minus pi would work. Um, so repeating constants work too. X squared plus uh, pi to the seventh power would work. I mean, it doesn't matter what, the, what that number is. So Justin, the general antiderivative would be what? I think you already said it, but. X squared plus C still. Plus capital C. There we go. That's our general antiderivative. If this was all antiderivatives was, then Cal 2 would be easy, as you might imagine, right? But it, it of course, gets much harder than this. So we, we have to start, start somewhere, right? Okay, how about this? How about x to the fourth? Now, let's try and find an antiderivative. Who's up here? Is Jorge here? Is your audio working today, Jorge? Are you here? I see no Jorge. I see no Jorge. OK. Let's see. Bree, you're up. What's wrong, Bree? Are you all right? 
Oh, wait, sorry. I'm a, I meant to click the unmute button. Okay, give me any function you can come up with that when you take the derivative of it, you get x to the fourth. Uh, I can't. Uh, I don't, I don't know. Okay, so when you take derivatives, what happens to the powers when you take derivatives? I mean, you subtract one, so okay. x to the fifth, but. Yes, but what? You're, you're on the right track, but what? But the five would have came down. That's so right, the five would have come down. You don't want that, right? So no. what could you very cleverly put in front of the x to the fifth that would, that would kill that five when it comes down? What number do you need that would, when the five comes, it's gonna hit that number and become a one? Um, what, one fifth? One fifth. Okay. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Right? One fifth. Yeah. That's it. That would work, right? Does okay. everyone see that? That five comes down, hits the one fifth, the one fifth goes away with the five. You have the one now, it's the power comes down, you got X to the fourth. And then, you know what, let's just get the general. Plus C, boom, there it is, okay. right? That'd work. Let's keep going. Next one, square root of X. Why does it keep doing it? Brian, you're up. I was looking for my unmute button. All right. So to the antiderivative of that. It might help, Brian, if you just rewrite that square root of x as x to a power. What? Yeah, x to the 1 half. OK. So and so it would be one x to the one point five, or so okay. x to the three halves. Three halves you can put x to three halves. Okay, so Brian, yeah. talk me through why you're doing three halves. Because you would have to subtract one from the top. So you so, have to subtract one from this and get one half, right? Yes, and so but yeah, then the three halves would go. So you would have to go to the. Uh, Two thirds? Two thirds in front. Front, yeah. Exactly. Plus C. So Brian's thinking to himself, I think, if I'm incorrect, tell me. Brian was thinking, I need to subtract some, I need to subtract one from something and get one half. Mm -hmm. So really to figure out what that number is, just add one to one half. Right? Just take one half and add one. And that gave you that gives you three halves. Just like Bree did the four and then said, oh. I need to subtract one from something and get four. So just add one to four, you get five, right? This number in front here, notice that the number in front is the reciprocal of this power. So if this is three halves, Brian put two thirds, right? Brie had a five as the power. What's in front? The reciprocal of five, one fifth, right? Let's go back one. When we were here, we didn't have an issue, did we? Because the two was here already, so we didn't have an issue. But when we take those numbers out of the front, we get something a little more complicated. Let's do another one. How about this? Who's the lucky one here? Gabriella, are you here? Yes, sir, I'm here. Are you following this so far? Yes, but then when you made it into a fraction, I wanted to. <laughs> I have no words. You'll, you'll um, be so all right. I would just first off re uh, rewrite the square root of x to x to the negative one half. So seven x to the yeah. negative one half. You want yeah. that? Yes. I agree, that yes. looks good. And then you would add one to the negative one half. 
making it a positive one half. That'll be positive one half. Good, because you're going to add then, two over two. That gives you right. positive half. So that's what you want as your power up here? Yes. OK. Now, Gabriella, this is the part I'm trying to trick you, because I put that seven out here to make your life yes. more complicated than it is. Yes, but think, think about it this way, Gabriella. When you take derivatives, when you have constants, don't they just come for the ride? True. Right? Yes. So if you do an antiderivative, shouldn't, shouldn't it they also just, just go for the ride? Yes. OK, so let's just bring that seven out front. And I left a space there. Why did I leave a space there, Gabrielle? What did what did um, um, what did Brian do? What did Bree the, yeah, do? A recipro uh, reciprocal yep. fraction. Yep. One so seven. what's the reciprocal that's going to need to go in front here? Brian did three halves, the reciprocal two thirds. Bree did five, reciprocal so one. So two. One half, reciprocal, two over one, two. which is two. So that means you'll have 14 X, X to the to one, the one half. half. Which is really just 14 square root of X. And then plus C, we need to put the plus C out here. Right. Now everyone, what's, I know my video's off, I'll have it on in a second. What's the good news so far about antiderivatives? What's the good news? It seems fairly simple. I mean, it's mostly it's just the opposite. Instead of like for power rule, at least instead of minus one, you just add one, and mm -hmm. I mean, then just throw out your reciprocal, and you're good to go. One plus c. Yeah, and and one other thing is, could could Gabriella and Brian and Bree and Justin could they check their answers? Could you check yes. your answer to see if it was right? Mm. How do you check your answer? You would just, just take, do the reverse. Derivative. take the derivative, right? Take the derivative and you better get this, right? And that is one good thing about Cal2 is that when you're asked to find antiderivatives, you can always get it and then check it. But it does get to a point where you don't want to check it because it'll take too long. Okay, now I think you're catching on to the idea so it's time for the power rule. Just like we have a, a power rule for taking derivatives, right? Our power rule for taking a derivative is you bring the power down, right? And you subtract one. For antiderivatives, it's opposite. So here's what we do. If you have a function f of x, which is x to some power n, then the antiderivative should be equal to, okay, Jair? Oh wait, no, Marissa, is Marissa here? Let's see, I don't see Marissa. Okay, Jair, it's, it's you. So Jair, tell me about the power. If, if we start with x to the n, tell me about the power on x over here. Um, Say again? It would be, would it be like x n plus? I didn't hear you, sorry. Uh, I'm not sure. N plus what? Not sure. Well, on all of these, weren't we just adding one to get these oh, powers? Yes. Right? It's so whatever the power is here, we're just going to add one to that, right? So if it was negative one half, we added one, we got a half. If it was uh, four, we added one, got five. If it was a half, we added one, got three halves, right? So whatever the power is, we're just going to add one to it. But then what did you have to have out here? Remember? Oh, the reciprocal of n. Reciprocal. So n plus one is a number, right? The reciprocal of that should be one over the n plus one. That should be a number that you multiply out in front by. And then plus c. That is our power rule for antiderivatives. If you like just using formulas, there it is. 
I think it's a little better if we develop the formula out of some examples like we did. Now, there is one problem with this formula. Does anybody see it? There is a problem in one specific case, this problem, this formula falls apart. Uh, you've got n's like negative one, maybe, then you get a if zero. If n is the what? If n is negative, what did you think? negative one, because then you'd if have. n is negative one, the formula fails. Why? Look zero. Look right here. Mm -hmm. Negative, if you plug negative one in here, you get negative one plus one, don't you? Negative one plus one is zero. Division by zero is undefined. This formula does not work when n is negative one. So I'm going to put that next to this. n not equal to negative one. This formula will work for all other powers of n except negative one. So that, of course, begs the question, what if n is negative one? So what would our function be? With that specific example, x to negative one, that's really the function one over x, isn't it? And who can tell me what the anti antiderivative of one over x is? Oh, careful. The antiderivative of one over x. So what was it? Uh, one over x squared. Take the derivative, you get one over x. It's one over x squared, isn't it? No. No, no, no. no. LNX. Oh. LNX. Right, OK. Yep, natural log. It's the natural log. So this is natural log. And then from now on, we're going to start putting absolute value around the x in there. For, um, to make sure that this is defined, the domain is defined, we're going to put natural log the absolute value of x, because you can't plug negatives into natural log. So basically, both of these together cover all powers of n. All powers of n are now covered. With me? Okay, so what we learned is that if we have a constant attached, right? A constant attached, it'll come for the ride, but backwards. We're gonna apply the power rule, right? And that's how we do this. So I'm gonna give you a problem to work now. I want you to use this power rule. I'm gonna leave it right here. I'm gonna use that power rule. But this is a problem you haven't seen yet. Let's go with this. 4x to the fourth minus 5x to the negative 3 plus 7 over x cubed minus 4. I want you to find the general antiderivative, all right? So find capital F. Now, the thing I wanna point out that we haven't done yet is that this is the first time I've given you a problem that has multiple terms in it, separated by addition and subtraction. But think about it. When we were taking derivatives, if we had plus and minus, we did them individually, right? Same thing happens with antiderivatives. You will focus your attention, you will do antiderivative that antiderivative of that, antiderivative of that, antiderivative of that, and you'll just have pluses and minuses between your answers. And then what you do is you put one big capital C at the end. You don't need a capital C for each one. Okay, so see if you can do your power rule on those. I'll give you, I don't know, six minutes. Can I change something? I'm gonna change one thing because I just realized I gave you the same thing. Um, negative five, uh, X and negative three is the same as this. So I'm gonna change this one down here. I'll challenge you a little bit. Let's make that one the cube root of X instead of X cubed, the cube root. I'm going to call on four people to give me the four parts.
I'm gonna call on, uh, see, is Matthew here, Diaz? I don't see Matthew. Caitlin? Is it Caitlin or Catlin? I don't think Caitlin's here. I can throw one if you want it. All right, Nathan, you're up. Nathan, are you, you good to go here, at least on the first part? Yes. Okay, so you're going to handle this one for me. What did you get? Uh, for that one, I got um, four over five X to the, uh, to the fifth power. Good, very good. So I'm going to put the answers here if they're correct. We'll just move on. If you have a question on how someone got that answer, then we should go into it further. You just need to let me know, okay? Very good. Uh, did you get the next one, Nathan? You want to try the next one? Um, I can. I'm, I'm a little confused on it, but uh, I mean, what I got was uh, minus um, 5 over 2 x to the negative uh sorry x to the uh negative squared power or two power whatever okay <laughs> close it's close there's one thing off so let's let's do this one a little bit slower okay so <clears throat> nathan you've got the negative five is going to come for the ride okay i'm going to do this kind of over here you have the negative five that comes for the ride yes then I'm going to leave a space in front. X, now you got the power right because you took negative three and you added one and that gave you negative two. You need the reciprocal of negative two out front. What's the reciprocal of negative two? Think of negative two as being negative two over one. So what's that reciprocated? That would just be negative two? No. Negative or, or, two over one, flip it over. Just oh, flip so it, right? One over two. One over negative two. One over negative two. You were missing the negative on the two. So what happens here is when you put these two together, you have a negative over negative, and that becomes a plus. So you get five over two x to the negative two. Does that make sense? Yes. So here we're going to put plus five halves x to the negative two. I think you had said minus, if I'm not mistaken, you had put minus, so. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on that one? I'll, I'll move this to the side in case someone wants to look at it some more. All right. Uh, good, Nathan. Uh, Brandon, is there a Brandon? I don't think there's a Brandon. Uh, Cody, you're up. Okay, so. I changed the cube root x to x to the negative one over three. Pull that out, basically. So I got um, I got minus twenty one over two x to the two thirds. Okay, so you looked at this as being seven times x to the negative one third. Is mm -hmm. that what you said? Yes. Okay, so then when you do the antiderivative of it, you're going to have the seven comes for the ride. You added one to the one negative one third. What'd you get when you added one? Two over three. Two over three, and then out front, you put the reciprocal of that? Yeah, three over two. Three over two. And now when the seven multiplies this, you just did seven times three on top? Yep, so I got 21 over two X to the two thirds. That's right, good. Does that make sense to everyone? We have one more, the hardest one. Cody, I'm gonna give you that one because that's the hardest one. Right, well, the derivative is zero, but I just put minus C. That's what I wrote. Antiderivative. Oh, the antiderivative, yeah, well, that would be. What would the antiderivative of four be? What do you take the derivative x. of to get it's to four get x. four? Four X. Yeah, so minus four, four X. Four X, so minus four X. It was the easiest one, but for some reason I tripped up on it for a second. <laughs> All right, there's our antiderivative. We'll th throw a plus C on it and we will call it done. Does anybody have any questions over any part of that? 
the answer written in this format is fine. Okay, you don't need to do anything else. You don't need to drop that down as an X squared. You can, but you don't have to. All right, we keep going. What I'd like to do now is a slight variation of this problem. Take that same problem like this. And I'm going to take the whole thing and divide it by x to the fifth power. Now, while you're writing that down, in the previous problem, it was just the numerator, right? And there was addition and subtraction between the different terms. And so I said, you can do them individually, right? Just do them individually. Here, we have division of two things. So do you think that we are going to be allowed to just do that, find its antiderivative, and then do that and find its antiderivative and put a division bar like this and just, oh, come on, like this, and just write the antiderivatives of each of these on top and bottom. Do you think we'll be able to do that? No, we're going to have to use a difference quotient. That, that, so we cannot do that because that's not the way derivatives worked, right? Which is so like, if you do everything in yellow, find its antiderivative, do everything in blue, find its antiderivative, and then go check your answer and take the derivative of the top and bottom, that's not right because it's a quotient. So you'd have to do the quotient rule. And so it would not match, okay? So we can't do that, which means how the hell do we do it? Because... As of, as of this point, I have not talked to you at all about how to do the antiderivative of a quotient. But because I made this problem special for you, there's only one term in the denominator, right? One term. And you have multiple terms in the numerator. So using just properties of fractions, I'm not doing any antiderivatives yet. I'm just using algebra here. I can rewrite this problem like this. That step is algebra, right? I can only do that <clears throat> because I have one term on the bottom and multiple terms on top. If it were the other way around, everyone, if it was the x to the fifth on top of all of these, we could not do this, all right? Now I'm gonna continue doing algebra and I'm gonna rewrite these. So I'm gonna use properties of exponents now. I'm gonna figure out what that is and figure out what that is and figure out what that is. And that one, I'm just going to move up. So I should get four X to the negative one minus five X to the negative eight plus seven X to the, I think it's negative 16 thirds minus four X to the negative five. Do y'all know what I'm doing there? Like for example, You're just combining negative exponents with the, with the bottom. That, are... that becomes x to the negative one third minus five. I'm using this property, x to the n over x to the m equals x to the n minus m. That's what I'm using for each one of those. Still no antiderivatives yet. This is just algebra to get us to a new version of the function that now is just separ separated by addition and subtraction. Questions up to that point? When you look at this, there should be, it should be like this glaring light burning your retinas, this right here. You see that negative one? That's the one case that we have to be careful with. Remember, if N is negative one, that's a special case. So we have to remember that when we go to do the antiderivative of this, this is really four times one over X. That's really what that is. And then when we do the antiderivative, we're gonna get a natural log. So I'm gonna do capital F now. 
first one will be four natural log absolute value of X. I'm gonna go a little slower on this. <clears throat> this one is minus five, it comes for the ride. X to the negative seven, because I'm adding one to the power. And then I need to put the reciprocal of that out here. So this will be one over negative seven. Plus seven X. Now I'm gonna add one to this. If I add one, that means I'm adding a three over three. I should get negative 13 over three. And then out front, I'm gonna multiply it times the reciprocal, three over negative 13. And then the last one, minus four X, little space in front, I'm gonna add one, so negative four, and then I put the reciprocal of that, one over negative four out front. It's amazing, it's not amazing, it's, actually kind of funny to me that how much of Cal 1 and Cal 2 come down to you taking a fraction and either subtracting one from it or adding one from it or adding one to it. Like in Cal 1, you need to be able to subtract one from a fraction because when you do the power rule, you, su you subtract one. And in Cal 2, you need to be able to add one. All of these problems, add one to that, add one to that, add one to that. So you start to get really good at adding one to a fraction. You start to just be able to do it mentally at some point. Okay, here we go. Clean up time. I'm missing the plus C at the end. Okay, this will become a positive five sevenths X to the negative seven, a minus 21 over 13, X to the negative 13 over three, plus X to the negative four. That's because the negative four cancels out with the negative four on bottom and you just get X to the negative four plus C. Right. And get back to my notes. So I'm not going to go through these, but not quickly, but here is all I'm doing in these notes is showing you that, hey, if we have a little f, we can find the antiderivative and that it creates a family of functions, right? There's, there's this family of functions that's created. And they all have the property that the slope of the tangent lines are equal. That's the property that they all have together. Now we need to look at page 249 from our book to be able, um, oops, that's spelled wrong. For common antiderivatives. All right, so what I mean by that is now that you've taken Cal 1 and finished the derivative part of, of Cal 1, you should be able to tell me the antiderivatives of some things just from your knowledge of what you know about derivatives. For example, if I tell you little f of x is cosine of x, capital F of x would have to be what? So what do you take derivative of to get cosine? Sine of x. Sine of, sine of x, right? Sine of x plus c, plus c, right? So the antiderivative of cosine of x would be sine of x. You need to know that. That just needs to be automatic. There's another one you should know. Sine of x. So let's see who's up here. Samuel, I already called on you. Let's see. I'm kind of back at the beginning again. Uh, Christian? So carefully, Christian, what would the antiderivative of sine of x be? So what would you have to take the derivative of to get sine x? Negative cosine. Good, negative cosine of x. So do you all see where the negative came from? 
the fact is that if, if you just put cosine, right, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So that wouldn't match. So Christian had to put a negative out here. That way, when you take derivative of cosine, you get negative sine, but then the negative and negative become positive. So you get sine x plus c. Hmm. Are there any others that we should probably know? Well, we should know this one, secant squared x. We should know what the antiderivative of that is because we learned in Cal 1 that that's the derivative of what? Tangent x. Tangent x. Alejandro, I didn't call on you, did I? Did I miss you or did I call on you? Mm, no, I don't think you did. I miss you. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, now you have participated, so. We are. We already know you know it, Alejandro. It's, you know, there's no need to ask, you know. <laughs> oh, it sucks. <laughs> so what about this then? What about, what about tangent x? Because I did, I did cosine, I did sine. We didn't do tangent. I skipped a secant squared. That seems kind of strange that I did that. But there's a reason I went straight to secant squared and didn't do tangent after I did sine and cosine. The reason is that in Cal 1, we never learned that the derivative of something was just tangent x, right? We never learned that, right? We know the derivative of tangent is secant squared, but we don't know what you take the derivative of to get tangent, right? This, for now, is an open question. We don't know. <clears throat> Would you like to know what it is? I'll tell you. Yes. It's actually the natural log of secant of x plus c. Now you would never think that, but we can check it by taking the derivative. So let's try this. What is the derivative of natural log of something? One over that okay. something times the derivative of that something times the derivative of secant x. What's the derivative of secant x? Secant x tangent x, right? And now your secants cancel and you're left with tangent x. So how would you have ever come up with that, right? Like that seems like that would be a little bit pushing a little too far to just mentally come up with that. But we will have a way, okay? There is a way to do this problem, all right? I just, we're not there yet. But that's, I'm trying to show you why I went from here to here and then I went to here and I didn't do this because right now we kind of can't. And we can't do it with any of the other ones either. Like if I tell you, hey, what's the antiderivative of what's another common trig function? Uh, just secant x, right? No go, not, not right now, not today, all right? What's the antiderivative of cosecant x? Nope, not happening. Also cotangent x. We don't know the antiderivatives of these, but we do know the derivatives. All right, 427. I think this is a good point to come to an end. What I will say is that you, you may have forgotten this. The whole, the whole, I guess, point of this, of antiderivatives, we know, we know why derivatives are important, right? Derivatives are important because you can get slopes of tangent lines. You can use that to find maxes and mins. You can do optimization problems, related rate problems. There's a lot of different things you can do application-wise with derivatives. The question becomes, what are antiderivatives good for? In the beginning of class, what I told you is that, um, if you were to take a graph, like let's just, let's take an, take an easy one. Maybe I can do this in three minutes. Let's take the function f of x equals 2x, all right? Let's, let's just look at that between 0 and 3. So if I plug in 3 into this function, I get 6, right? If I take a look at this function and I imagine kind of like shading below the function down to the x-axis, I would get this yellow triangle, wouldn't I? 
a question would be, what's the area of this? Now, can you tell me the area of this triangle with no calculus at all? Do you know the base? Yeah, we got the base and the height. So, you know the height? so the base is three, the height is what, six? The area should be one half the base times the height. So that should be, I think, nine, right? Should be nine. Do y'all agree that's nine? But look at this. What's the antiderivative of that function? So y'all told me it was what? X squared. X squared. Yeah. Now it's X squared plus C, but let's just look at one specific one. Okay, this one. What I'd like for you to do now, and this is the part that you're like, why do I do this? Just, just do it. I'd like for you to take that capital F and I'd like for you to plug in the right endpoint three. And then I'd like for you to take that capital F and I'd like for you to plug in zero. So I'm telling you to plug three into this and then zero into this and subtract the two answers. And when you do that, you'll get three squared minus zero squared, which is nine. And the fact that these match is not a coincidence. That is a property of the antiderivative. So if you wanna take something more complicated, like let's say f of x equals x squared, graph that from zero to three, and find this area, it's no longer a, a triangle. So you can't use one half base times height. That's out the window because it's curved, but you can use the antiderivative. You could take the antiderivative of that, which would be one third x cubed, and then evaluate it at the two endpoints again. And if you do that, 27 thirds, you get nine. Or you get, do you get nine again? That's just coincidence. That's a coincidence. That has nothing to do with what happened up there. If you plug in three, you get 27. One third of 27 is nine. You plug in zero, you get zero. So the area of that is nine. And that works for any function. As long as you can find the antiderivative of it, you can find the area below it. And then that area will mean something later. It might mean, you know, some other, might take on some other physical representation. So that is going to be known as the fundamental theorem of calculus. We'll get to that later. So as far as homework, um, we're not doing curve sketching. Optimization, you should make sure that you're okay with these. And then as far as antiderivatives, four, seven, we're not quite there but I think we're there enough to get the first parts done. I would look at like the, the first 13 of these, everything before 13, hold off on 14, 17, 18, 19. Those we're not quite, we're not quite ready for. All right, that's it for today. We'll be back on Thursday. We'll continue. All right, any questions? I'm going to jump over to my, my office hours, um, which is a different Zoom session because it's open to all my classes. So I'm going to jump over there if you have any questions about the, the bonus question or anything else. Um, that's where I'll be, unless there's something short that someone needs just, just, just to ask for now. No? How will we resubmit the... Bonus. Same Dropbox. Same. Just use the same Dropbox links. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. All right. We're gonna cut this off, and I'll be in my office hours if you want to talk. So have a good one. Have a good day, sir.